Welcome to the Justice Committee's 36th meeting of 2017. There are no apologies, but we do have two declarations of interest. Liam Kerr. Yes, I uh, declare an interest as I'm a current solicitor registered with the Law Society of England and Wales and the Law Society of Scotland. Ben McPherson. First to my voluntary register of interest as a registered solicitor on the role of Scottish solicitors. Thank you. Agenda item number one is a decision on agreeing the themes for the stage one report on the offensive behaviour at football threatening communication repeal Scotland bill in private. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number two is consideration of an affirmative instrument, the Criminal Legal Assistance Miscellaneous Amendments Scotland Regulations 2017. And I welcome Annabel Ewing, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs and her officials, Stephen Tidy, Police Division, Eileen Grimmer, uh, Civil Law and Legal Systems Division, and Sadif Ashraf, Director of Legal Services um, with the Scottish government. Um, I, I put it on record at the, the very beginning here that the committee has received submissions, quite a, a number of submissions from various legal bodies on this instrument and the committee is extremely grateful for, for these submissions. Uh, this item is a chance for members to put to the Minister and officials any points seeking clarification on the instrument before we formally dispose of it. I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and invite the Minister to make a short opening statement. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Convener, I too would wish to draw members' attention to my entry in the Register of Interest, wherein they will find that I am a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I do hold a current practicing certificate, albeit I'm not currently a uh, practicing convener. These regulations will ensure legal aid continues to be available following commencement of Part 1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016. Part 1 of the Act will deliver key changes to police custody processes. It will also introduce investigative liberation, changes to police liberation, post-charge questioning and the self-contained court procedures that can arise in relation to these processes. The Act provides that persons in police custody will have a statutory right to a private consultation with a solicitor at any time. These regulations ensure that this consultation is provided free to everyone in police custody. To reflect the additional considerations that may arise when dealing with a person considered, considered vulnerable, solicitors will be paid a higher rate for such consultations. The decision as to whether an individual is considered vulnerable will be for the custody officer. Investigative liberation will allow the police to release a suspect from custody with conditions. The person subject to the conditions can apply to the sheriff to have these conditions reviewed. Where a person is in custody and is charged with an offence, the person may be released from custody with an undertaking. In both cases, the person can apply to the sheriff to have the conditions reviewed. Legal aid will be available for representation before the sheriff. The Act will also allow the police to apply to the court to question a person after they have been charged. This will be known as post-charge questioning. Where an application is made by the prosecutor for post-charge questioning, legal aid will be available for representation before the sheriff. The commencement of Part 1 of the Act and the need to change legal aid provision to support it provided the opportunity for us to implement changes on wider fee reform for police station advice. The Law Society of Scotland previously recommended that a system of block fees for police station advice be introduced. These regulations will implement that recommendation as well as significantly simplifying the process for solicitors claiming fees for police station advice, which simplification had also been requested by the Law Society. There was significant stakeholder engagement around these regulations. We engaged with stakeholders and we listened to the concerns of the Law Society of Scotland. From an original proposal of approximately 2.46 million per annum, we increased our offer by increasing the level of block fees, <coughs> by extending the times when unsocial hours premium is paid, uh, and by providing that the unsocial hours premium be applied both to travelling time and to telephone calls. Our offer to pay the unsocial premium to travelling time was not one that the Law Society had formally sought. However, we felt nonetheless that it was justifiable uh, to make such application. Our current spend on police station advice is in the region of £520,000 per annum, and the regulations in front of the committee will increase the spend to an estimated £3.2 million per annum. This is an updated figure, convener provided uh, by uh, officials. 
This figure includes the new court and custody work available to solicitors as a consequence of implementing the Act. Eight stakeholder events were held across Scotland to seek the views of the wider profession and 50 local faculties and practices were consulted on the draft regulations. The Scottish Government has moved its position considerably on the amount to be paid for police station advice fees, but given budgetary constraints, we could not meet every single ask of the Law Society. The Scottish Government remains committed to maintaining legal aid for those who need it most. We believe that this is a good offer to the profession and implementation of these regulations will enable us to meet our ECHR obligations when Part 1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act is implemented. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, uh, Minister, for that statement. Can I, um, at the very beginning, express some concern about the time frame the committee has to, to look at this? Um, you've said there's been a number of submissions, and they have they've been detailed and quite concerning in, in content. Um, this is an SSI, it's secondary legislation. We've had one week, a few days, literally, to look at this. So I'm putting on record now um, that I think that's an inadequate time frame for us to look at it. But before we go any further, I'd like to hear from other members. John Finney. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, Minister. Minister, we, we have a number of submissions um, from various bar associations. Well, there's a very detailed submission from the, the Scottish Legal Aid Board. And if I refer to uh, a paragraph in which they talk about the consultation and the, the, uh, the events that took place, engagement events, they say, um, no fundamental concerns with the working of the new regulations were raised at these engagements events or during the Scottish Government consultation exercise. That certainly doesn't seem to be the case with regard to all the submissions received. How, how would the Scottish Legal Aid Board form that opinion, do you know? And, and obviously we don't have them here to ask them <laughs> that. So. Well, I, my understanding is that um, what was probably intended to be reflected in that statement was that in terms of the, the approach being taken, so a block fee approach, uh, simplification, streamlining of processes, uh, that uh, uh, the, the general approach being taken was not at issue, of course, it has to be said that uh, uh, certain uh, responses have uh, referenced the level of fees, uh, but in terms of the general approach, it was, I guess, what the Scottish Legal Aid Board was trying to convey was that the general approach uh, was not deemed to be unworkable or meeting with fundamental problems of principle, but of course, uh, as with all these issues, the level of fees, of course, was an issue uh, and is an issue for some members of the profession. Well, I, I know that members will have questions on fees. If, if I could ask two practical issues then, please, and that, that's in relation to a, a representation we've received um, and was part of some ongoing work that the police committee was doing, and that is the actual location of uh, custodies. So someone may well be called out to, to represent a custody, and, and as it says, police operational requirements and centralisation of custody units may well mean that a suspect is moved from Edinburgh to Greenock, for example. Do, do you believe that these um, proposals are sufficiently encompassing to ensure that someone isn't, uh, first and foremost, can get the representation they need and that the, the lawyer delivering that isn't disadvantaged financially or in terms of time? Okay, um, in terms of the, uh, the issues around um, the practicalities of, of why, in the scenario that the, the member has raised, uh, Greenock to Edinburgh, or vice versa, my asking my, my, uh, the, Mr. Tidy to come in. On, on that, but in terms of the, the approach of, of uh, the legal aid cover, obviously um, what we would have are um, payments to recognise travelling time, uh, and the travelling time uh, would be at half rate, half attendance rate, uh, and also uh, if carried out wholly or partly in unsocial hours, uh, there would be the, the uplift of the 33% unsocial hours premium attached to that in addition to uh, mileage, uh, where the travel is over, I think it's a two-hour uh, two period, uh, that is the automatic uh, claim that can be made in terms of the simplified processes, online processes, uh, then authorisation would need to be sought uh, from SLAB, but uh, the SLAB facility for that would be available 24-7, and where you could show that uh, 
the, the distance required, uh, perhaps road, local roadworks being at play, perhaps weather conditions being at play as well, uh, then uh, that would be taken into consideration in terms of any grant of, a, of an extension of the tra automatic travel time that can be uh, assumed. So that would be the, the way that the fee uh, structure would, the, 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 the legal aid fee regime would look at the issue of travel. But perhaps I could ask Mr Tidy just to, to get to the first point of Mr Finney's uh, question. Yeah, uh, thanks Mr uh, Finney. When someone's still at the suspect status would be taken to the closest custody facility and interviewed there, there wouldn't be long distance travel involved in that because it would be counterproductive for the police because they would have to go back to take witness statements, etc. So they would be taken to the closest custody facility for the interview to take place. So that, that the scenario as outlined by the Law Society of um, a solicitor being called out to represent someone in Edinburgh to find that they'd perhaps been transferred to Greenock, that could not happen? Well, there, there may be exceptional circumstances where after the initial inquiry was dealt with, the person was interviewed for that particular crime, another crime that the person was suspected for may be discovered at a later point in the person's custody after they've been transferred. But that would be an exception uh, where another crime that the person was suspected for would be identified. Minister, we've had two bits of thank you. We've two bits of legislation alluded to the working time regulations and also ECHR Article 8. Do you believe that the existing scheme is compliant in both these terms? Uh, yes, uh, and I mean, I think it has to be recalled at, uh, at the outset that the duty is not uh, mandatory to participate in the duty scheme, and even if participating in the duty scheme, it, it, you can make yourself unavailable. Uh, and I think those basic uh, rules of the duty scheme are important to, to bear in mind uh, uh, in this uh, uh, regard. That doesn't change with the new scheme. The previous scheme was compliant and this one is. Uh, no, the, the, the duty scheme remains an option for a solicitor to participate in or not. And secondly, even if you participate in the duty scheme, uh, you are not uh, required to make yourself uh, available at all times. Uh, and indeed, I don't know if we're getting on to the, the code of practice that has been uh, in discussion with the Law Society and has just been issued in, in final form yesterday. We have, okay, so would I yeah. hold fire on that just yeah. now? Um, or, uh, are you finished? Before we leave this line of questioning on travel, then um, perhaps Mr Tidy wasn't aware of the evidence that the police subcommittee heard where police are routinely uh, or very frequently having to travel very long distances um, in order to access a custody suite. So obviously there's a time implication there. And in some of the evidence we've looked at, um, or it's been presented to us, then it's not just the uh, travel time. If, say for example, a doctor isn't um, available to do the necessary tests, then um, one submission was a solicitor leaving at 10 to 11 uh, to attend a, a, a police station where they're required to be and leaving something like six o'clock in the morning and being in court at 10 o'clock the same day. Now, it seems to me there are most certainly working time directive implications in that. To what extent has the minister looked at these implications? Uh, so reference to that submission, what I would say is I don't know the fa all the facts and circumstances and if we knew the facts and circumstances, we could have a look at that in detail. It was just a, 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 a paragraph about uh, a set of circumstances but I don't know all the ins and outs of that case I'm very happy to have that looked at but absent the information in detail of the specific facts of that instant case it's quite difficult to make a, a detailed uh, response no to point it. The point that I took from it Minister was that you the, the solicitor can appear at the, the station ready to represent um, the client, but if say, other um, people are involved, like a, a police surgeon, and you're waiting for them to turn, then you can be there for many, many hours. So without looking even at the specific incident, there's a general point there I think um, needs addressed. Uh, well, as I say, uh, first of all, in, in citing an instant case without giving all the details of the case makes it a wee bit difficult to make a detailed comment on an instant case if you don't have all the information. But I would go back to what I said, that the duty scheme is not a mandatory scheme. It's not mandatory to apply to be a duty solicitor, and it is not mandatory to make yourself available at, at all times, even if you are a, a participant in the duty scheme. So those are two fundamental issues uh, uh, to bear uh, in mind. And in terms of the 
making yourself available and t on call 24 seven and all the rest of it uh, in the discussions on the code of practice, uh, language to the effect that you know the solicitor could leave a voicemail message to say I'm unavailable that was unacceptable for whatever reason to the profession so in the interest of, of reaching a compromise uh, the Scottish Legal Aid Board agreed to delete that language so uh, a, a solicitor is not even required to leave a message on their answering machine to say that they're unavailable uh, which would actually be helpful because then it would reduce delays uh, because otherwise the uh, police uh, or the Scottish uh, solicitor, uh, the contact line, have to uh, just assume uh, from silence after a certain period of time that th that particular solicitor is not rocking up. Uh, so anyway, we are where we are. The code of practice has been issued without that uh, requirement for a voicemail message to be left on the solicitor's uh, voicemail. Uh, so that may not eradicate some of the delays the members talking at the convener is talking about, but that is where we are and that is what the, the, the legal profession wanted to secure in the code of practice and that has been agreed to, uh, uh, I suppose, with some reluctance by the Scottish Legal Aid Board. There will be other questions on availability, but Liam Kerr, uh, Liam MacArthur, sorry. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, just following on a, a similar theme, uh, you refer to the fact that it's it's not a requirement on and solicitors to make themselves available for, for uh, duty, but uh, in a number of the submissions we, we've had from the Society of Solicitors uh, and Procurators of Stirling, Society of Solicitors uh, in the Supreme Courts, the Dunfermline District Society of Solicitors, uh, and others, they all make the point about um, their expectation that the, the regulations, if implemented as drafted, uh, are likely to make a situation where there is already um, uh, often a, a difficulty in, in, in getting solicitors to, to attend, that this is only going to be exacerbated by the regulation. I think the, the Dunfermline District Society at a faculty meeting um, have confirmed that the unanimous view of those present at the faculty meeting is that if the regulations are laid in the present form, then no firm will participate in the police duty scheme. And, and, and the others I've referred to uh, have made uh, similar points. So uh, the practical implications uh, of, of, of this would appear to be um, very serious and as the conveners already indicated um, we've had limited time uh, to take further evidence on, on that but how would you respond to the suggestion that um, these regulations are likely to make what is already seen to be a, 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 an area where um, there is not a, a, an overabundance of um, provision available uh, is only likely to make that situation worse? Okay, uh, I think to, to try to respond to the member's question as fully as I can, I would just mention a, a few different issues. First of all, I think it's important to recall that um, eight stakeholder events were held, so in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Dundee, Inverness, uh, Falkirk, uh, Kilmarnock and Dunfermline. Uh, and in addition, uh, in terms of the, the consultation on the draft regulations themselves, that was commenced in August. Uh, initially, it was a four-week consultation. The Law Society of Scotland requested an extension. An extension was agreed to. The consultation closed on the 15th of September. 50 faculties and, and uh, member practices were uh, consulted, and we received from the legal profession three responses. The Law Society of Scotland, Edinburgh Bar Association, and the Dunfermline uh, Society of Solicitors. So a consultation of 50, we received an, an extended consultation, we received three uh, responses. In terms of, of my engagement with the process, I have had several meetings with the Law Society of Scotland and their uh, legal aid negotiating team headed in this instance uh, by Mr Ian Moyer uh, and other uh, officials from the Law Society. Uh, and I have to say that uh, in the end of the day, um, the, 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 the ask, the key ask of the Law Society that we couldn't meet, having met several of the other asks, was an increase in the block fee itself. Uh, and we did go away and look at whether there was any room within the, the legal aid budget to try to do that. And we came back and explained to, to Mr Moore that that would not be possible. But when we got to that stage, so that is at the last 28th, 29th of June of this year, the outstanding issue was the increase in block fees. It wasn't any other issue. So we had, uh, we had already increased the block fee rate to, re to reflect concerns. We had already extended the definition of unsocial hours to include not just as it is at present, which is from 10 p.m. until 7 a.m., but to include uh, from 7 p.m. until 7 a.m., to include all uh, day Saturday and Sunday, and to include eight specified uh, national uh, holidays. Uh, and we applied that to telephone attendances uh, for uh, uh, work, telephone calls wholly or partly made 
during the unsocial un un hour. Uh, and we applied that to travel, notwithstanding the fact that Law Society had not initial, initially requested that. So we did move considerably uh, to the extent that we could within budgetary constraints. Now, the last issue that was on the table, if you like, was the issue of the increase in block fees. And we explained to Mr Moore why we, we couldn't move any further on that. Uh, and that was in the position with the Law Society negotiating team uh, at the end of June of this year. Uh, and the the issue was that I was to go away and look at an issue that they had raised. I did do that and we wrote to them I think on the 30th of July after I'd had a chance to do that and then we proceeded to consultation. So um, that is the kind of background. So I, 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 I note some of the representations that have been made to the committee in the last uh, few days or so but that is not the position that we had or I had in my dealings with the Law Society at the end of, of June of this year. What assessment, though, have you been... I mean, as I say, the Dunfermline District Society could hardly be clear in terms of their expectation about um, the consequences of, of passing this resolution. I mean, what assessment has been made um, of the, the, the likely availability of solicitors uh, on the basis of, of the, the provisions of this regulation? Because, uh, as you say, I mean, it's, it, it, there's no requirement placed on solicitors, but, but ultimately, I suppose, the committee needs to be assured that the availability of solicitors are there in order to satisfy access to justice and, uh, and all the rest of it considerations. So uh, what assessment has been given, either on a national level or potentially regionally um, specific, problems arising uh, due to a lack of solicitors being okay. available? Um, what I would say is, uh, just to, to explain briefly the, what, what the process is, so the, the duty scheme uh, for both police station and for court is, uh, is in place until the end of March of 2018. Uh, to withdraw from the duty scheme, you have to give one month's notice. Um, what we plan to do, uh, what the Scottish Legal Aid Board plans to do is to um, uh, seek uh, intimate, uh, re request interest in the, the new duty scheme for police station and court going forward post-March 2018 uh, by the end of December of this year. Uh, uh, with a view to seeking uh, uh, intimation of interest in the, the new duty schemes going forward for court and police station uh, uh, by the, around the 26th of January of 2018. Uh, 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 so that is the kind of process, the normal process that would apply anyway. So that uh, allows us to, uh, to be apprised of uh, instances where any particular solicitor was seeking to withdraw from the duty scheme uh, and allows us uh, time to put in place uh, 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 the arrangements going forward. Uh, obviously, it is a matter for each solicitor whether they wish to participate in the police station duty scheme or indeed the court uh, uh, duty uh, scheme. And if uh, there was not uh, take up to uh, an extent that it would uh, change the, the kind of status quo in terms of numbers, then obviously the Legal Aid Board uh, would seek to make alternative arrangements and uh, has been given consideration to that uh, very scenario if that were to come uh, to pass. Say what those alternative arrangements would be, because as I say, we're being told that even the status quo is leaving things very tight in, in certain areas. Uh, a suggestion that this would exacerbate that that situation, I think, has to be a concern. Well, uh, so for example, additional uh, having additional solicitors in place to deal with duty, uh, police station duty, would be a, a possibility in, from, for example, the PDSO, uh, and that would be one uh, possibility that the Legal Aid Board could uh, pursue. Obviously, at the moment, um, we have not received any mass uh, intimations of withdrawal from the duty scheme uh, and very happy to keep the committee apprised of any developments in that regard. Uh, there is a one-month notice uh, period, as I say, as regards any withdrawal, uh, uh, and therefore we obviously continue to monitor the situation very closely. Uh, but in the end of the day, we have to remember also that this is very much about the rights uh, introduced uh, to be introduced by the Criminal Justice Scotland Act, voted on by this Parliament, very important rights uh, 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 meeting our ECHR obligations uh, and ensuring that we can extend free legal provision at uh, police stations uh, to uh, all those who are uh, detained at the police station as was foreseen in the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 during its legislative passage. And we will ensure that that happens uh, because that is the obligations that we are required to meet under the ECHR. And we hope that solicitors will feel that this deal, uh, which I think is a good deal, uh, and which deals with a lot of the issues that had been raised 
uh, and also provides for a, a, a simplified um, process of claiming your fee, which is very important because at the moment, uh, the, the cumbersome nature of, of the the process whereby you have to also get a signature, a hard a copy signature of the client, uh, and it's a two-stage process in terms of getting your fee. Uh, many, many uh, telephone calls are simply unclaimed for, uh, bearing in mind the consultation can be done uh, by telephone. Many uh, telephone calls are just not claimed for because solicitors feel that it's too much of a hassle, frankly, to, to go through the procedure uh, of doing that. We, we don't want that to be the case. We want people to be paid for the work that they do, uh, and therefore we hope that this new package the level of fees, the simplified procedure, uh, and the uh, uh, application of anti-social hours premium to, to travel, as I said, we hope that, um, and the a, a wider definition of uh, uh, anti-social hours, we hope that that will uh, make this a more attractive option uh, for the solicitor profession. Just with one process point, you mentioned um, previously, uh, Minister, the engagement with the Edinburgh Bar Association amongst, um, uh, I think, a couple of others. In the Edinburgh Bar Association's um, submission to the to the uh, committee, they suggest the association would like to make clear to the committee that these policy developments have become known to us by virtue of having been told of them by individual police officers. It is a grave concern that they have not been the subject of official communication. The concerns which this association has had about the imminent introduction of these statutory provisions have been well known to all relevant bodies for several months, that we have not been made aware of these policy positions which serve to confirm uh, our suspicions is indicative of utmost bad faith. I think to the point that John Finney raised initially in, in terms of the evidence we received from the Scottish Legal Aid Board, it's hard to square those, those, two, um, uh, those two conclusions. I wonder whether you might be able to shed light on it. Okay, just to separate, I think, what are the two separate issues here? First of all, on, on the general fee regime, uh, yes, we had engaged in the consultation that we engaged in eight stakeholder events, 50 uh, firms, uh, faculties uh, targeted in our consultation, Edinburgh Bar Association being one of the three uh, uh, of the legal profession who responded to our consultation. So that is on the fee side of things, but I think perhaps the members getting to the criminal justice uh, provision side of things, and perhaps Mr. S uh, Tidy can explain exactly the nature of the uh, level of engagement with the profession on the part of Scottish Government Police Division and others, not just with the Edinburgh Bar Association, but with the profession as a whole. Uh, perhaps you could explain, yeah, because he was involved in yeah, some yeah. of this work. Thanks, Minister. The, Mr. Mavs made a number of uh, commitments during the progress of the bill to engage with stakeholders uh, regarding the new provisions of ethical liberation and post-charge question. We carried out a number of stakeholder events with the legal profession and other victims groups. Uh, we carried out two events for investigative liberation. We carried out two events for children's provisions, both of which were attended by uh, the legal profession. Uh, myself and a Police Scotland officer have carried out uh, individual presentations to Glasgow Bar Association, Falkirk Bar Association. We've carried out a webinar event with a lot of society. We've carried out a joint event with John Scott QC regarding Part 1 provisions. We attended the Legal Aid Conference to carry out a, a presentation on Part 1 provisions, and I did make an offer to Edinburgh Bar Association back in August uh, to carry out a similar uh, presentation on the provisions within Part 1 to their members, uh, which wasn't taken up. Okay. Uh, Mary Fee, followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you very much, and good, good morning, Minister. Um, a number of the areas I wanted to ask about has already been touched on by Liam MacArthur, so um, I won't go over them again. I just wanted to raise with you a concern that has been raised with by the Dunfermline District Society of Solicitors. Again, they talk about the duty of care that employers have to their, to their staff, but they also um, raise a concern around sex and equality discrimination, um, because they say that the effect of the lack of re remuneration for those on call, and while I accept that no one, it, it's not mandatory that solicitors will, will be on call, but there is no provision available to fund childcare, nor to provide care for ill or infirm dependents. And they say they are really quite serious concerns. Um, and they also raise the concerns that firms in the future potentially could be drawn to recruiting only those who do not have children or caring responsibilities. And to me, that, that is a, a quite a, a serious concern. And, and I wonder what thought the minister has given to that. Yeah, I, I, I noted those uh, points raised. And you know, I, I do go back to the point that this is not a mandatory, um, it's not a mandatory uh, obligation to, to participate. And I would also say in that regard that 
the nature of, of, of police station duty um, is, is such that it's, it's, it, the actual hours of operation are out with the control of, of anyone, really. So it, it, inherently, in the nature of that particular kind of work, uh, there will be instances where it does involve uh, unsocial hours. And that, of course, for the individual's concern, uh, involves a whole series of issues as regards childcare, as regards caring for elderly relatives, as regards caring for... Uh, and from members of the family, uh, and that is uh, why also it is recognised that the system is not mandatory, and even if you are uh, in hoping to make, be able to make yourself available as a duty solicitor, you're on the roster and you're, you, that's your plan, nonetheless, uh, you can be unavailable, and that also is uh, accepted within the duty scheme, and it does recognise directly, therefore, the kinds of circumstances that Mary Fee is talking about. But in the end of the day, the nature of the duty system at the police station is such that it will inevitably uh, involve uh, hours that make life difficult in terms of planning, uh, but it is recognised that nonetheless you can make yourself unavailable, uh, and uh, that is recognising also the circumstances which Mary Fee rightly raises. But, but again, I mean, the, the point that they're making, particularly in relation to small firms who have a very small core team of, of solicitors, um, if they have participated in the scheme in the past, and they are in the, the, the position where they are recruiting solicitors, they may be minded to recruit solicitors who do not have the responsibilities that we've discussed. And that's a very, very serious avenue to start going down. I, I agree with the member, absolutely. That would be very serious indeed. And I, I would find it rather disturbing uh, that members of the legal profession would, would uh, consider acting in such a way because acting in such a way is clearly discriminatory. Uh, and there are, you know, there are various uh, ways to seek to solve matters and uh, the, last, the, the very last way uh, uh, and unacceptable way would be in a discriminatory fashion. Uh, I just really don't accept that that is what people be, would be required to do, uh, not least because the duty system is not a mandatory uh, uh, system. Uh, 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 and uh, I think, you know, in terms of the, the deal being uh, offered, I think it is a good deal and it is certainly much better than uh, what solicitors have been participating in up till now. And I make one final point in terms of practical, trying to look at practical solutions. Uh, I understand that in terms of the, uh, uh, the, the time scale within which a, a legal trainee can appear in the criminal courts, that's being shortened uh, to reflect uh, a number of issues, including the kinds of issues that the member has raised. Could I just, following up on Mary uh, Fee's point there, ask if the, the Minister has done an assessment of the increased number uh, of people who would now be eligible for legal advice? I think there was a figure in the, uh, the financial memorandum the financial to the Criminal Justice Scotland. Bill. Yes, there was. There was figures there um, on the number of cases we would anticipate. We have no idea of what the new court practices will mean, um, but there, there's a figure of 1,600 and something, I think. It said 1,663,360. Uh, uh, yeah, so while the Minister is saying quite confidently that people can opt out, there is going to be potentially a huge demand here and a real problem if um, so many people do for the reasons already discussed, decide to, to opt out, ask her to take that on board. Liam Kerr. Uh, just following up on a, a few of the points made, if I may, Minister, am I right in thinking that there's been no equality impact assessment done as at this stage, or has that been done now? There was a sort of equality impact screening done and uh, on the basis that there were no groups with protected characteristics that were identified uh, as, um, as any issues being raised with regard to those groups, then a full EQIA was not proceeded with on the basis that no groups with protected characteristics were affected. The people that were listed as affected were uh, lawyers. Yes. Uh just so I'm clear, though, so when the Law Society say that as at the start of November there was no equality impact assessment, that remains the case, doesn't it? Well, there's no full uh, equality impact assessment. There was a screening done. There were no groups with protected characteristics uh, identified as being affected, and therefore it, the process did not therefore mean proceeding with a full uh, EQA. And if I might press you on Liam MacArthur's points, various representations we've had suggest that the, overall, this could make it less attractive to enter the profession. And taking the convener's point, uh, there, there could be less 
resource to, to dispose of these matters. Uh, so then we can't meet the ECHR rights, if that's true, that you alluded to earlier. So do you accept that, or are the, are the representations we've had not correct in some way? Um, well, uh, firstly, the, the position is that uh, as of the moment, we haven't uh, received any mass intimation of withdrawal from the duty, uh, police station duty scheme, uh, uh, and obviously we don't know the future. I'm Sorry. asking, okay. Minister, just to, I understand why you went down that route, but what, what I'm asking is the attractive, attractiveness of the profession in general. We're trying to encourage, we're going to need a lot more resource going forward by the sound of it, uh, and that will require people to enter the profession. And there is a suggestion that this is going to make it significantly less attractive to enter the profession and that there will be a resource problem going forward. So it's not about people dropping out of the duty system, it's about people not entering it in the first place. Uh, that's the representations, uh, or the, we have had representations to that regard. Uh, do you think that they are reasonable? Do you think that will come to pass or do you disagree with those representations? Uh, well, I think it's all quite speculative. I don't have any evidence to suggest that uh, this in and of itself, uh, this regulation proposing a f the fee regime and the uh, accounting, uh, simplified accounting process will in and of itself lead to some mass uh, decline in people seeking to do police station uh, duty across Scotland. Uh, and indeed, it's important to remember that um, the, the stakeholder engagements that were held, and going back to Mr Finney's first point, the, the kinds of issues that were raised were more to do with the level of fees, and, and that was a, a, a feature particularly of central belt participation, more to do with fee levels than other considerations. It wasn't that people were coming to say, this whole thing is unworkable, go back to the table. They weren't coming to say that. They were raising their concerns about fees, uh, and that, as I say, tended to be more uh, prevalent uh, in areas out with the Highlands and, and Aberdeen. Uh, but uh, that then, I think, has to be borne in mind that the, the, there wasn't a big kind of outcry about this, uh, this scheme per se. I mean, this was picking up on the existing scheme but making it better, seeking to make it better, and indeed in my negotiations with the Law Society of Scotland's uh, legal aid negotiating team. Uh, again, it wasn't about the scheme and the nuts and bolts of the scheme, it was about the fee compensation. And indeed, at the very end of the day, it was about one aspect of that only, and that was about the level of block fees and nothing else, because by that point, it appeared that they had reached uh, a, a reasonable deal that they felt was reasonable uh, in all the circumstances. Uh, and just finally, if I may, the, um, you talked there about the existing scheme. Uh, as the convener said at the start, we haven't had a, a great deal of time to look at this, so forgive me if I'm off on a tangent. Uh, it appears to me that if, if this doesn't go through, there will be some kind of lacuna uh, coming in January that uh, it, this, the system doesn't, the, the present system doesn't carry on uh, the present system will disappear. Uh, and if this doesn't go through, it, it, we, we will almost default back to an even less favourable system. Uh, could you explain that? Because it, it just, it's, I, I feel slightly like we're getting bounced into something. Um, so the, the, the plan would be if, if uh, uh, passed by the committee in the Parliament that the regulations would enter into force on the 25th of January 2018, the day that the Part 1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act provisions enter into force. Um, the, if the committee chooses not to pass uh, these regulations, then what would happen is that this scheme would not be in place. So that would in turn mean the following. First of all, in terms of current police station duty activity, um, the, uh, the level of, of, of uh, the fee regime, the wraparound fee regime, would be the current one. So it wouldn't be the increased antisocial hours definition, it would be the current antisocial hours definition, which is uh, uh, more restrictive. It wouldn't be the application of the antisocial hours to travel, it wouldn't be the increased block fee, uh, uh, and therefore the position would be far less attractive for solicitors than the new regime. And of course the position for billing would remain the old position, which is much more cumbersome to the point that many solicitors don't charge for telephone attendances. In addition, in terms of the uh, provisions regarding the fact that all detention at police station, although I don't like to use that word, but all detention, de facto detention at police stations uh, 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 at the moment is subject to uh, no uh, financial uh, uh, 
uh, eligibility criteria being in place, that would change as well. And finally, for the new, that would change as well. Can I just clarify, just uh, basically the current arrangement that we have today, if this doesn't pass on the 25th of January, then the current arrangement that people understand as it today will continue indefinitely? No, I'm saying that I'm trying to break down the three areas w w which are concern coming into play here. First is that the level of fees will be lower, okay, and less attractive to the profession. Secondly, today. Well, sorry, today, no, today, yes, the yes, status quo. Yes, sorry, before on. the regulations, before it, the regulations come into force, it will be the level of fees that currently apply. Indeed. Yes, if this doesn't pass. Today's scheme carries on indefinitely. In the, the uh, as regards the level of fees, there are different issues as regards the assessment of financial eligibility. And finally, with regard to the new provisions being introduced by uh, the Criminal Justice Scotland Act as regards in, uh, investigative uh, liberation uh, conditions being reviewed, as regards undertaking conditions being reviewed, and as regards post charge questioning applications for uh, authorisation of that uh, uh, being heard. Uh, we would need to then look at having a, a system in place to cover those because those are new provisions, they're not covered by the provisions today, they're being introduced by part one of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 on the 25th of January next year. Uh, and that could be, if necessary, by way of, for example, general uh, determination being made by ministers. For, um, I think John Finney and I were the only people that did this bill and I certainly had huge reservations about the changes. Um, at present, someone's brought in for questioning, and at the point of interview, they are um, they're eligible to have a solicitor there, and then they may be charged, or they may be released without charge. Under the new uh, system, then we've got pre-charge arrest, and as soon as they're brought to a police station, then they must have a solicitor there, and obviously that has huge cost implications. Two elements there, Convener. One is that this, the, the client would be entitled to have a solicitor present for interview. For an and interview. the other provision yeah. is that the client would be entitled to seek a consultation with a solicitor at any time. But that consultation can be by, for example, by way of the telephone. Yes, but they could be held in custody for quite some time without having to. It's absolutely essential under the new legislation that the, assist, that the um, solicitor attend. No if, no buts. It's uh, for the interview, uh, but not for the consultation. Under the new system? Yeah. yeah. From the point of arrest? Only when they're interviewed or from uh, the point the, of well, arrest? Well, the entitlement is to have a solicitor present at interview. The entitlement also is to be able to consult your solicitor at any time. That That's consultation can be by way of present. telephone. So at the, at the point of arrest, then the solicitor is there. And I think that's where um, we're on to the 24-7. Um, well, it, and consultation by telephone. Yeah. Could Maurice Corrie now ask Good evening. Can, I, can I ask Mr Tidy a question? Um, have, during your research for this, and, and I come to this as a non-lawyer, um, has any comparison been made with any other professions or industry and in how they deal with antisocial hours or work required by the team, the management in that, and indeed overtime requirements? And if not, why not? I, I'm not sure to what extent there has been a, a detailed analysis with regard to other uh, professions. Um, the, the point of the exercise here is that this is not a um, this is not a, a compulsory part of your contract of employment. This is a, 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 an optional uh, op a, a opportunity, if you like, for the individual solicitor solicitor firm. This, uh, even if you do participate in the duty scheme, as I've said, you you are not required to make yourself available. 100% uh, of the time, uh, and therefore I, I'm not sure therefore that a direct analogy would stack up. This is not a, 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 an obligatory part of your employment uh, contract. So it hasn't been done? No, but it's, I don't know if the analogy is, is directly relevant because it's an optional, the duty scheme is optional, uh, and participation, uh, once you are uh, signed up to the duty scheme, your participation is not uh, uh, required 100% of the time, no. I understand that, Kavina, but surely um, when you're trying to, um, we'll say, market this to the profession, the legal profession, it is useful to have it on the baseline of, of, of what goes on in other professions and indeed in industry, because we have very clear guidelines in industry there uh, on times over normal working hours, i.e. overtime, the care, child care, the care for the elderly, are all taking consideration as employers. It doesn't seem to be this has not been applied clearly in your research. Well, I mean, the lawyers already work... Uh, 
in many cases beyond nine to five and it would be up to their individual firms to, to make appropriate arrangements uh, and I'm sure that they all do that. In my discussions with the legal aid negotiating team and Mr Ian Moore who was heading that up, um, it, it was kind of taken as read that this was kind of the duty scheme and what they were trying to achieve was uh, the best deal that they could get for their members in terms of the fees, uh, uh, the recompense available for to for, for participation uh, and uh, as I say the, 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 the conversations were very much rooted in the context that this was the police station duty scheme with which they were well acquainted. Uh, that uh, concludes uh, the, the question. Sorry Mary. Yeah. Can I ask just a, a very small follow-up question to the question that um, Maurice Corey asked you. Ha, are there any figures that you could give us of the number of solicitors that are signed up currently to the scheme and how many solicitors, when asked to come out, opt out and, and say no, they can't come out and make themselves unavailable? I would have to get those statistics. So it would be interesting well. to see how many are signed up and how many... Um, I mean, I think it's, it's fair to say in the discussions that we had, uh, that SLAB had with the profession about the code of practice and at the various stakeholder engagement events, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our kind of last minute sticking point was language that would have suggested that a lawyer had to, on their answering, answering machine, uh, make a statement to the effect, I am unavailable, contact the solicitor contact line. Uh, the profession, that was a no-no for the profession. They refused to countenance that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why they suggested that would uh, give an idea of 24-7 availability, whereas others could perhaps view that as just leaving a message on an answering machine to say you're unavailable. But it does suggest that already there are instances where uh, uh, that uh, somebody may call out for one particular kind of case but may not decide to call out for another kind of case. So that... Um, freedom to engage or not engage is already very much uh, a feature of the but system. It, but it would be helpful to, no, to, I mean, to, we see, can try to see to seek that information, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That concludes the points of clarification, Minister. You, you've, you've made quite a lot of the fact that you feel a lot of these concerns raised around the table were not raised in June, but the point is they have been raised now. And if I could just recap on some of the things that we've raised around the committee in terms of the increase of police station attendance, the change in employment contracts required, the duty of care implications, um, the, the sleep issues, the disruption with family life, sex equality discrimination, um, for those that are carers or in caring um, uh, obligations. Police Scotland policy, plea charge arrest requiring a solicitor as well as an adult to attend. Vulnerable adults with mental health and other issues. The increase of the number eligible for legal aid advice, 163,360. The fact that firms are downsizing um, at present and may find it impossible, even with the best will in the world, to meet these obligations. The lack of communication. The, uh, a lot of the submissions have said they found out for individual police officers there was no uh, official communication of some of the implications. Um, some firms have, have no idea if they can fulfil the service or role expected of them at this time. The travel issues, time taken and the movement of custodies around the country and the lack of custody suites can all add to the travel and the time that this is impinging on um, a, a solicitor's time 24-7, their right to a private life and therefore Article 6 concerns um, have been raised, human rights concerns um, in terms of unsocial blairs and real concerns about the working directive. This morning, Minister, you've had 35 minutes to put your point of view together with a written submission. In all fairness, um, I'm asking you to withdraw the SSI to allow the committee to take evidence from some of the stakeholders before um, these regulations are passed. May I come in? You can. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you. Very. I think um, it should also be noted at this time that there are a number of us around the table who uh, note, the con note the concerns, to, but to are, are satisfied else. with the, 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 the proposal that's been made within the financial constraints at the moment um, and, and didn't ask questions 
on the basis that we were If that's uh, the case, it will be reflected the, on the any subsequent vote. Should the Minister decide not to <coughs> agree to what I think is an entirely fair and reasonable request, having had now 36, almost 37 minutes of giving what could be looked at as a very one-sided um, view of these implications, which beyond doubt, I mean, it just is not in question that these are complex and they go far beyond um, the, the monetary and financial implications. Um, well, Kabira, I, I would say I think I, I, I look back at the, the, the official report might be helpful in due course because I have sought to answer fully and comprehensively every single question that has been put to me as of my officials uh, with regard to the, uh, the issue of, of the uh, concerns raised uh, for the committee today. Of course, we did consult uh, with the profession. We consulted with some 50 uh, firms we got we got three you've made that point yes, and i know you were, i feel you've it's made that point time and again uh, uh, but on the basis of what you've just said and suggesting that there's been a lack of communication i would just like to deal with that point specifically if i may because there has not been a lack of communication we got three responses to a consultation that was issued in august and finished by way of an extended deadline if you forgive on the me i'll interrupt September. you there, minister and explain what the lack of communication was it was specifically on the police policies and how they would then in impact on yes, solicitors. Yes, but Mr. Seidy has if explained... If you allow me yeah. to finish, Minister. Yeah. Uh, I, take leave, I took fully on board that in June you had done a full... Um, am I missing something here? Um, you'd done a full um, consultation and um, you thought that the, uh, the concerns expressed today weren't raised then. We take that on board. The point is... The committee must look at these concerns they've been submitted and the consultation point i was talking about was in one of the submissions that talked about the implications of police policy and, and that was that from the affect. Edinburgh Bar Association and Mr Saidi explained that he had uh, been in contact directly with the Edinburgh Bar Association, I think it was in August, Mr Saidi, offering uh, a special wraparound session for the Edinburgh Bar Association as he had done with the Glasgow Bar Association and all the other events that had been organised by the Scottish Government Police Division and the Edinburgh well, the Bar debate, Association been every opportunity. did not take that I up. put the question so, to you, will you withdraw no, I the SI? In that case, we move to formal consideration of um, this legislation under agenda uh, item number three. Point, you can't have a point of order and we do move on now There's to... There's an opportunity for members to comment during the debate on the motion. There will be an opportunity for you to comment during the debate if you have anything to say at that point before we move to a formal vote. We're now going to formal consideration. That's the informal part of the... Of the the, the motion of the, we now move to formal debate the minister has explained she's not going to withdraw the SSI so the next part of the procedure is to move to formal debate the minister will make some opening statements if she wants and um, move the motion and members will have a chance to put other points of view is that understood Agenda item three is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and has made no comment on it. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate if that's necessary. The motion is motion 09233 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Criminal Legal Assistance Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2017 draft be approved. I invite the Minister to speak and move the motion. Uh, yes, I, I would just reiterate what I have been trying to express in, in the first evidence session. Uh, we did proceed with the consultation. Uh, only three members of the profession, if you like, Law Society, Edinburgh Bar Association, and Fermanagh District Society of Solicitors responded. Uh, there has been widespread engagement on the part of the Scottish Government Police Division on the Criminal Justice Scotland 2016 Part 1 provisions. Uh, that included an offer to the Edinburgh Bar Association who failed to take it up for whatever reason. That's a matter for them. Uh, the nature of the scheme is that the, the, there has been a police uh, station uh, a duty scheme in place for some time. We are seeking to improve that, not to make it more difficult. It is to be recognised as well that uh, the right to consult consult a solicitor will include telephone attendances and therefore that should be factored into the uh, consideration of the uh, displacement of people uh, or, or otherwise. This I think in terms of the financial compensation for solicitors represents a good deal within the current budgetary constraints. Uh, in our discussions with the Law Society negotiating team and Mr Ian Moyer, 
Uh, the only outstanding issue when we left the table on the 28th, 29th Jan, uh, June of this year was the issue of a, a look at whether we could increase the block fee from the increase we had already uh, uh, provided. And further to my deliberations and looking at the figures, we just could not uh, afford uh, to do that. That was communicated to the Law Society on the 30th of July in a letter I sent to Mr Moore. I think we have worked very hard to come up with a, a scheme that is more attractive rather than less attractive uh, and also in terms, importantly, of being able to claim a fee without going through hoops to do so. That is a very important part of a lawyer's <laughs> daily activity uh, and I think the simplified fee structure as requested by the Law Society of Scotland, the fact you don't need a, a, a hard copy signature, uh, the fact that it's not now a two-stage process to claim your fee, I think uh, will ensure that actually lawyers are paid for the work they do, which is something that we would all uh, wish to see. Finally, the very important provisions of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act come into play on the 25th of January uh, 2018. Uh, these are seen as very significant provisions voted on by this Parliament, very significant provisions uh, increasing the rights of, uh, of individuals held at a police station. I think that's something that this Parliament should be proud of and I would be very keen to see us ensure that nothing happens such that those uh, enhanced rights could be put in jeopardy. Do mem oh, could you move the motion? I formally move the, yeah. the motion. Thank you. Do members have any comments? And it is only comments at this stage. No comments from members. Um, my only comment is that um, I haven't been satisfied with the minister's um, uh, explanation today. And in all fairness, I think the, the people who have made and raised very concerning and complex issues about this um, SSI should have their opportunity to be heard and for the committee to evaluate um, if these are genuine concerns, if there's concerns that can be resolved or if... Um, or if they have no foundation in them. But I think for the smooth running and fairness and access to justice, then that should be the case. I therefore put the, uh, to the minister if you would like to wind up. I, 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 no, I, I've just moved to the move. Okay. okay, I put the question. The question is that the motion 09233 in the name of Annabel Ewing be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. Uh, those who are... Agreed first or not agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Those who agree with the SSI? Those who are not agreed? Right. Those uh, for the SSI, eight. Those against, three. Which means that um, the, the motion, the SSI is passed. I thank the Minister and her officials for attending and um, I will, um, there will be a report on this and given the controversial nature of it, then I'll ask the uh, vice convener also to look at the report and make sure she's satisfied with them. Okay, if the committee can uh, tent with that approach. Okay, thank you for that. Um, thank the minister and her officials for attending and suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses.
item four is consideration of an affirmative instrument, the Police Investigation Review Commissioner application and modification of Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016, Scotland Order 2017. And I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice and his officials, George Dixon, Police Division, and Louise Miller, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper two, which is noted by the clerk, and I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a short opening statement. Thank you, uh, Convener. It may be helpful if I briefly explain the purpose and effect of this order. Part one of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 represents a significant change to the system for arresting and holding people in custody. The new arrest and custody processes contained within part one of that act will provide a clear balance between the proper investigation of offences and the protection of suspects' rights whilst in police custody. As the Police Investigations and Review Commissioner can be instructed by the Procurator's Fiscal to investigate criminal allegations against a police officer, Part 1 of the 2016 Act needs to be extended to cover criminal investigations undertaken by the PERC. This order applies to a number of provisions of Part 1 of the 2016 Act to cases where a member of staff of the Police Investigation and Review Commissioner is exercising the powers and privileges of a constable when undertaking a criminal investigation on behalf of the Commissioner. This will ensure that the PERC investigative staff adhere to the provisions of the 2016 Act and that any police officer arrested or detained by the PERC receives the same legal protections as a member of the, pu the public arrested by the police. The order also makes modifications to ensure that where, 20, the, where 2016 Act functions rely on the rank structure of Police Scotland, that it reflects the hierarchical structure of the PUC when also exercising those functions. For example, when a senior investigator is required to authorise an extension to a detention in custody. Well, the order provides for modifications to the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016 to cover at PERC investigations, the practical working arrangements have also been considered. The PERC and Police Scotland have agreed a framework that will include a, a memorandum of understanding to ensure it is known how they will deal with cases that require a criminal investigation when the Crown Office have directed the PERC to do so. This is particularly important as the PERC will need to make sure, make use of Police Scotland's custody facilities in the course of their work. All such investigations will be carried out under the direction of the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. If approved, this order will come into force at the same time as implementation of Part 1 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2016. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. Do members have any comments or questions? John Finney. Keep saying, officer. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, you, you said that the PERC staff would need to use Police Scotland facilities. In the paper we have here, the policy note, it says it's likely that PERC investigative staff would use the Police Service of Scotland custody facilities. Um, if not Police Scotland facilities, what other facilities would be used? Well, the reality is it would be Police Scotland's facilities because they hold all the custody facilities which we have. So it would be difficult to envisage any other facility being used. Okay, thank you. And, and also, in, in relation to the, the specific, as it says, uh, a memorandum of understanding between the police service and PERC will set out. Can you confirm the staff association and trade unions will be involved in discussions around the memo of understanding, please? So the uh, work relating to the mem memorandum of understanding has been taken forward by Police Scotland and the Crown Office in developing the protocols around it. Uh, the process that Police Scotland have in place for consulting the uh, the staff associations is through the Police Scotland Programme Board for the implementation of the 2016 Act and any discussions relating to that will involve the police staff associations who are involved in the Programme Board uh, uh, around any aspects of the Memorandum of Understanding that's then put in place between Police Scotland and the Crown. And the trade unions? Um, uh, I don't know, are the trade unions involved in the programme? But I don't believe the, the trade unions are directly involved in that process, but I can check with Police Scotland for you uh, and come back to you just to clarify the engagement they would have with the staff associate, or with the, with the trade union organisations. Okay, thank you very much indeed. More questions or comments from the Minister? Do you wish to wind up, Minister? No. In that case, the question is that motion 09233 in the name... Oh, is that the right one? Right, sorry. 
Oh, sorry. Sorry, wrong place. <laughs> In that case, I'll put the question that motion 09393 in the name Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed to thank the Cabinet Secretary and officials for attending. Um, before I suspend our, uh, our members' content to delegate authority to me as convener to agree the draft report content. Thank you for that. Suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses. is considering of the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill at Stage 2 and ask members to refer to their copy of the bill and to the marshalled list of amendments for this item. I welcome back the Cabinet Secretary and a change of officials and now move to consideration of the amendments and call Amendment 13 in the name of Mary Fee in a group on its own. Mary Fee to move and speak to Amendment 13. Thank you, Convener. The purpose of the amendment in my name is to strengthen the bill by requiring the Scottish Government to produce an annual report as soon as practicable after the 31st of March each year. The report would contain information on offences created by Section 1 of the bill and aggravated offences under the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act 2016, including the type of support and assistance provided to victims, the average period of time in which support was provided and the provision of funding to secure that support. The report would also contain information about the number of relevant proceedings to which special measures were applied for and authorised. And it's my intention that the new reporting mechanism would build an evidence base which could be used to improve services for victims and demonstrate that the bill is being properly implemented. The annual report would become a vehicle to ensure that support is provided to victims of domestic abuse, that there is appropriate funding for organisations supporting victims, such as voluntary and third sector organisations, and that special measures are provided for victims and witnesses appearing in court. There is a significant level of consensus about the aims and objectives of the bill as it stands, and the inclusion of my amendment would simply establish a reporting mechanism to ensure that government, the courts and public services are delivering the ambitions for better victim support that we all share. And I move the amendment in my name. Do members have any comments or questions? Minute, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Convener. Amendment 13 is, I understand it's set out by Mary Fee, intended to address concerns about the need to ensure that effective support and assistance is in place to help victims of domestic abuse. I recognise that the intention of this amendment is to collect information that would seek to enable steps to be taken to both monitor and improve how support is provided to victims of domestic abuse. Whilst I sympathise with the intention behind the amendment, I am concerned that it risks placing a significant burden on the mainly third sector bodies who provide support to victims of domestic abuse and that this burden could potentially mean less of the funding given to these bodies going directly to help victims. Many of the third sector groups which provide support to victims of domestic abuse receive funding from the Scottish Government and as a condition of that funding they are of course required to report on how the money is spent and on what support they provide to victims. However, I'm afraid that I have some concerns that the level of detailed information that this amendment would require third sector groups to collect and pass to the Scottish Government 
is disproportionate to the aims of effectively monitoring support provided to victims of domestic abuse. Indeed, it would mean that time and money could well be spent on reporting, which does not provide insight into how services could be improved. In order for the information that the amendment requires to be included in the report to be collected, third sector groups and other agencies that provide support to victims would have to record and transmit to the Scottish Government information about the length of time they provide support to each individual, the type of support they provide and the manner in which it is provided. In 2016-17, Police Scotland recorded 27,496 incidents of domestic abuse that resulted in the recording of at least one crime. If a significant proportion of the victims sought support and assistance from third sector bodies, the amount of data that would be required to record, be required to record and provide to the Scottish Government would be very large. I consider there is a risk that, given that each case will be quite different, any attempt to categorise the type of assistance and support that was provided or the manner in which it was provided would not necessarily provide the kind of detailed information that would enable decisions to be made on how services could be improved. The amendment is specifically concerned with cases involving the commissioning of offence under Section 1 of the Bill or an offence where the domestic abuse aggravation at Section 1 of the Abuse of Behaviour Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016 applies. Many of the groups that provide support to people experiencing abuse do so irrespective as to whether the victim has reported the matter to the police and they may not necessarily know whether the victim has done so or not. So an additional specific burden would be placed on some third sector bodies for this breakdown between, between help offered to people where an offence has been committed and where it has not been. There may also be data protection issues uh, with any approach which requires information to be shared between the police and third sector groups without the prior agreement of the subject of that data, which could add to the difficulty for third sector groups of providing accurate information about the cases to which this amendment relates. Convener, I have great sympathy for what lies behind the, this amendment and also the amendments lodged by Claire Baker relating to reporting on the operation of the new domestic abuse offence, which was debated on the 21st of November. However, I, do think, I don't think uh, we should rush to specify in law the exact detail of what data should and should not be collected. There should be a process where key interests are given the opportunity to offer views on what information would be proportionate and valuable to inform understanding of how the legislation is operating. And that process should also be informed by the fact that there will be information published on the operation of the legislation as part of the existing data routine, routinely made available by the Scottish Government in our criminal proceedings, re recorded crime and crime and justice surveys publications. I also have some concerns that departing from the normal approach to collecting a uh, collection of data for each new piece of legislation may not be the most appropriate approach. Convener, I'm happy to work with Mary Fee and Claire Baker ahead of stage three to consider whether additional steps are required to ensure that information relating to the provisions of support and assistance to victims of domestic abuse is collected and made available. However, for the reasons I've outlined, I am concerned that the approach proposed in this amendment would place too much of a burden on the groups that provide support, that they would have to meet the requirements of this burden from their existing resources with the potential unintended consequences of reducing direct support to victims. And I would therefore invite the member to withdraw Amendment 13. Mary Faye to wind up, press or withdraw. Thank you, um, Convener, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his um, remarks. Over the course of the committee's evidence sessions, members heard very moving testimony and compelling evidence about forms of abuse that are not sufficiently addressed in the law. And as I said in my earlier remarks, there is consensus around the need to tackle domestic abuse and the need to close the gap. And that's what this bill seeks to do. And I, I believe my amendment would strengthen the bill by placing a requirement on ministers to produce an annual report. And the reporting provisions that I have proposed in my amendment resemble the pr provisions of the Human Trafficking Act. And I do believe that writing reporting provisions in the bill would help ensure victims are properly supported and there is adequate funding. 
Um, and in, in my view, the reporting mechanism will deliver improvements in services, and it's for that reason I will press my amendment. Okay, the member is pressing the amendment. The question is that the amendment 13 be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. Right, all those in favour? All those against? There are five motion, uh, votes for, six against, therefore the amendment is not passed. Now move to call amendment 26 in the name of Maurice Corrie and a group on its own. Maurice Corrie to move and speak to amendment 26. Thank you, Kavina. Um, as I said, the, the, I would like to see the Scottish ministers take such steps as to allow for the domestic abuse bill to be properly conveyed and promoted to ensure that we have maximum public awareness um, in, uh, in society and also an understanding of the operation and clarity of the operation of this act by both um, the public and indeed the Police Scotland and their team and including the kind of conduct that, can, that constitutes abusive behaviour for the purpose of an, as an, of an offence under section 1, subsection 1 of the Domestic Abuse Bill. I therefore move this amendment in my name. Uh, do any other members have any comments or questions? No. John Finney. Thank you. Uh, through yourself to, to the Minister. I wonder if Mr Corrie could outline the, the range. I mean, I, I see a lot of merit in what you, of, of how that promotion would look. Presumably, Police Scotland will, along with Crown Office Procurator Fiscal, develop their own procedures in relation to dealing with this. But how, how would you envisage the public awareness? I, I believe it should be done on the on social media, uh, media, television, wireless, radio, sorry, etc. Also, I would ask for it to be put into public places such as libraries, um, such as uh, police stations, and indeed health centres. That is made aware that where these likely victims are would go, uh, and every possible government establishment that uh, the public uh, frequents. Any more comments? Any questions, Cabinet Secretary? Uh, thank you, Convener. Amendment 26 places a duty on the Scottish Ministers to promote public awareness of the new offence of domestic abuse. I begin by repeating what I told the Justice Committee when I gave evidence on the Bill at Stage 1 in June. The Scottish Government will take steps to promote public awareness of the new offence ahead of it coming into force and that this will include raising awareness as to the kind of behaviour that amounts to abusive behaviour as set out in the legislation. As it it has always been our intent to ensure that public awareness is raised prior to the implementation of the offence. And as I advised the committee a few months ago, Amendment 26 is unnecessary to achieve what Maurice Corey seeks, as it is going to happen anyway. In addition, I would add that such a requirement is not normally included in legislation. The statute book uh, would uh, become a bit crowded if we had a provision about publicity in relation to every new offence or policy that was put into law. When a new offence or other significant policy change is created, the Scottish Government will always consider what steps are required to ensure that the public is made aware of this. Members may remember uh, that earlier this year, the Scottish Government ran a campaign to coincide with the commencement of the Intimate Images offence contained in the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Scotland Act 2016, and that when statutory jury directions concerning how victims of certain sexual offences may react were commenced, we funded Rape Crisis Scotland to produce the I Just Froze campaign to change the public's understanding on why victims of rape do not always fight back or report the crimes straight away. On the basis of the commitment I gave to the Justice Committee in June, which I have repeated today, I would ask the Member to withdraw Amendment 26. Maurice Corrie, to wind up, press a withdraw. Um, I press the amendment and I'm slightly surprised by the Minister's retort on this uh, state and his statement because it was not the view he took in the debate when we debated the subject in the chamber. Okay, are you moving the amendment? Move there, I still continue to move the amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, the question is that Amendment 26 be agreed, are we all agreed? No. Yes. We are not all agreed, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against? 
for, three against, eight. The amendment is not passed. Call amendment 27, in name of Claire Baker, already debated with amendment 37 on day one. Claire Baker to move or not move? Uh, moved. The question is, amendment seven be agreed to, are we all agreed? Agreed, no. <laughs> We're not all agreed. 27. Amendment 27, yes. yeah. We're not all agreed. Uh, there will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against. Are there any abstentions? The vote is... Three, four, five against. I don't think that's no, right, is it? Take it, take it Two. Again. Could we take it again just to be absolutely sure? We seem to have an extra person, I think, in it. All those for? Two. Yeah. All those against? Abstentions? Yeah. Two for, six against, three abstention, the amendment falls. Call amendment 20 name, uh, 28 in the name of Claire Baker, already debated with amendment 37 on day one. Claire Baker to move or not move? Uh, moved. Moved. The question is that amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. We are not all agreed. There will be a division. Uh, all those in favour? All those against? Okay. All those in favour, six. All those against, five, which means the amendment is agreed to. Call amendment 138 in the name of Liam Kerr in the group on its own. Liam Kerr to move and speak to amendment 38. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the purpose of my amendment will strengthen the bill uh, insofar as the committee heard extensive evidence throughout this process of the requirement for emergency barring orders. Amendment 38 therefore requires the Scottish Ministers to carry out a review of legal measures that have the effect of temporarily excluding a perpetrator or a suspected perpetrator of domestic abuse from the home of the person they have abused or potentially abused. This review would need to take place within one year of royal assent on the Act and requires the Scottish Ministers to consult with certain specified persons in carrying out the review. The results of the review would need to be published and laid before Parliament and the Scottish Ministers would be required to announce their intentions in respect of the results of the review. Now I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary made a public commitment uh, in a letter of the 6th of November to the Justice Committee to formally consult on the introduction of new powers in this area, uh, but I would prefer to hear commitment in the Bill to obligate it and I therefore move the amendment in my name. Okay, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, any comments? Sorry about that. Any comments or questions? Okay, Cabinet Secretary. Commissioner, can I thank uh, members of the committee for considering the important issue of how people at risk of domestic abuse can be better protected? I understand that Amendment 38 is directed at the issue of emergency banning orders. As I'm aware that you heard a range of uh, opinion on the operation of emergency banning orders at your session on the 31st of October. While there were a number of views offered as to the potential benefits of emergency banning orders, there were also a very wide range of unanswered questions. Following that evidence session, I wrote to the committee to explain how the Scottish Government intends to consider the issue, the issues relating to emergency banning orders. I explained that a consultation would be published in early 2018, uh, seeking views on the many unanswered aspects of how such legislation may operate. These include what exactly should be the basis or grounds on which orders may be sought or granted, uh, who is to apply for orders and what court procedures are to be involved, who should have the power to exclude someone from their home, are there to be powers of arrest, what kind of funding would be needed to operate the scheme. These are just a few of the many questions that will need to be explored and they will be explored carefully through the Scottish Government's consultation. So today, I'm absolutely confirming, as I advised in my recent letter to the committee, that the Scottish Government will consult justice partners such as Police Scotland and the Crown Office and other people and groups who have an interest in these issues. 
Liam Kerr's Amendment 38 is, of course, well-intentioned and picks up on the discussion held by the committee. However, the Scottish Government has already committed to consulting on these issues, and so the amendment is unnecessary to achieve what is being sought, as what is being sought is going to happen anyway. In addition, I believe that it's not best practice to clutter the bill with provisions that say nothing more than what the Government has, as repeated by me on the record just now, already undertaken to do. In light of the firm commitment repeated today, I would ask Liam Kerr to withdraw Amendment 38. Liam Kerr to wind up. Press or withdraw. Uh, thank you, Convener, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his remarks. I am comforted uh, and reassured by the Cabinet Secretary's remarks and indeed the strength of the Cabinet Secretary's remarks, uh, and for that reason I shall withdraw the amendment. Are members content for the member to withdraw? Thank you for that. Uh, the question is therefore that section 13 and 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. That ends stage two consideration of the bill. We'll suspend briefly to allow change of witnesses. is our sixth evidence session on the offensive behaviour of football and threatening communications repeal Scotland bill. I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and paper five, which is a private paper. And I welcome to the meeting James Kelly, MSP, the member in charge of the bill. Mary Dinsdale from the non-government bills unit with the Scottish Parliament, and Katrina McCallum, Solicitor's Office, the Scottish Parliament. Um, Mr Kelly, do you want to make a short opening statement? Uh, I do indeed, convener. And can I start off by thanking yourself, the members of the committee and the clerks for the efficient and professional way that you've handled these evidence-taking sessions, taking evidence from uh, uh, members of the public and various experts. I think it's been very helpful indeed. Uh, I come to the committee this morning uh, to submit evidence and speak in support of my bill to repeal the Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Act. Uh, I do so and I, I believe that the evidence that the committee has received has been overwhelming in support of the repeal. In terms of the written submissions, over three quarters of individual submissions supported full repeal, as did a half, uh, more than a half of organisational submissions. I believe that the evidence sessions that the committee has held uh, have been very instructive. And we've heard uh, from football supporters how they feel that they've been unfairly targeted, that they don't support uh, the existing legislation. Uh, indeed, one, uh, and they've shown how, ineff how ineffective that legislation has been. Uh, one witness gave the example 
at a, a League One playoff match between Partick Thistle and St Johnson and how supporters were doing the conga and uh, were then uh, subject to the attention uh, and warned by the police. I think in terms of the legal representations from the Law Society and the Glasgow Bar Association, these demonstrate um, that the law is not fit for purpose. Uh, the Law Society uh, have established that all uh, prosecutions brought forward in 2016-17 uh, could have been captured by pre-existing legislation. They are also of a concern that the scope uh, is too wide and therefore the legislation is potentially open to further legal challenge. And that has been reinforced by the Scottish uh, Human Rights Commission who have said that potentially the legislation uh, or the Act is in uh, breach of uh, ECHR. I think that's a serious concern for the committee. We also heard from uh, academics as to how uh, people's freedom of speech had been impinged and how the legislation uh, had not been effective in uh, achieving its original objective. So in summary, convener, uh, I believe that the current act uh, is a discredited piece of legislation. It unfairly targets football fans. It is not an effective law and it is not achieving the outcomes that it's set out to do. And therefore, I submit to the committee uh, my position in full support of repeal of the, 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 the Act. OK, thank you for that. Now move to questions from members, starting with John Ard George Adam. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Mr Kelly. There has been this, uh, you'll no doubt be aware that the question I've been asking during the process, but there's been this urban myth that's created that the shame game and the two managers going toe-to-toe -to -toe was what brought this to a head. Now, it might have brought it to a head, but there's been a steady, systematic worsening of behaviour at games, both on the field and off the field. But it took a more sinister tone of that, round about that time. Like Trish Godman, the deputy presiding officer at the time, was getting a parcel bomb through the post. Neil Lennon, the same, and uh, the late Paul McBride was also targeted in this way. And Neil Lennon also received bullets uh, through the post as well. Surely, surely with all that in back, and when you think of the timeline at that moment in time, surely the Scottish Government were right in actually uh, bringing this legislation forward? Uh, I don't agree with the proposition you put forward, Mr Adam. Just to put it in context, um, I've been a football supporter for over 40 years. I attended my first football match in 1969. Uh, I can well remember a time, um, particularly around the late 70s and early 80s, where there was a lot of public disorder uh, at football matches, uh, where there was uh, singing of offensive songs, um, you know, by, by both sets of supporters going along to games where there were clashes inside the ground and also outside the ground and there was a, t a tense atmosphere around the football. I don't seek to sugar or coat any incidents um, that have happened over the last five, six years. However, and I, don't uh, and I don't seek to downplay the incident you described about people being uh, threatened with bullets in the post. However, the fact of the matter is that in terms of the game in March 2011, uh, there were 34 arrests and they in the main were for public order offences. They weren't in relation to uh, what people would term sectarian singing. The reality of that was that at the end of the game, there was a clash between two coaches and that then became the media image that dominated the media in the coming days and there was a reaction to that. It's also fair to say that it was in the run into the 2011 uh, election, and I believe, not like, if you let me answer my question, if you let me answer my Leetis question. is questioning, and that, then you can come in. Uh, it was in the run into the 2011 election, and the SNP captured that issue uh, in, in the run into the election, and then it was in the aftermath of that that they brought, rushed through this legislation uh, against the will of all the opposition parties in the Scottish Parliament. So, are you discarding the fact that bullets to Neil Lennon in the post, the deputy presiding officer sent a parcel bomb, Paul McBride QC as well, you know, all because, particularly the deputy presiding officer and Paul McBride, because they had a specific Celtic connection. You know, are you actually saying that these, are you discounting these and things weren't as bad? Uh, I'm exaggerating the way things were back uh, during no, that period. No, if you actually listen to what I said, I said I wasn't discarding those, those were very serious incidents and they were quite correctly 
dealt with by police and prosecutors at the time. What I've tried to do is to put behaviour at football in context uh, over a 40-year period. Uh, and I believe that the behaviour uh, was much more serious, you know, going back to the 70s and 80s. It's dramatically improved uh, since the advent of the Taylor Report in the aftermath of the Hillsborough disaster in 1989 and all seater stadiums. Uh, I don't downplay any uh, misbehaviour at football matches of, uh, of recent times. I think they've got to be treated seriously, but I think we need to put it in context. And what we saw was a complete overreaction from the SNP government when they pushed the legislation through against the will of all the opposition parties. Mr Kelly, do you believe it's correct for anyone to sing a song supportive of acts of terrorism at football? Uh, my position is that in going to football, um, I, I, go to, I go there as a football supporter and I, I sing football songs and I believe that that's what everyone should do. I think if anybody sings in a hateful manner towards, uh, towards a, a, either a religious grouping or based on race or sex, I believe that's totally unacceptable um, and people should be uh, brought to justice on that. Um, but I also believe that people have the right to uh, freedom of, of political expression uh, uh, with, within rights. And I have to say to you, Mr Adam, that I think in, in advancing that point of view, uh, you do so uh, with some lack of credibility. In 2015, you signed a motion uh, tabled in this parliament by Kenny McCaskill um, celebrating the Easter Rising. And if you went along to a football ground and you took part in songs commemorating the Easter Rising, you might find yourself spending some time in a police cell. The specific acts of terrorism I was talking about. I've uh, made my position off. clear that I believe people at football should sing football songs. If people sing and are, are demonstrate in a hateful manner, whether it's out in the street, in a club, in a local community or a football ground, that's unacceptable and should be prosecuted under Section 74 uh, in relation to religious aggravations. Um, but I do believe that people have the right to freedom of expression uh, as long as they're not participating in a hateful manner. So the example I used last week, which the Minister wasn't able to uh, deal with in terms of the Palestinian display at uh, Celtic Park, that is a legitimate right to political expression. I think that, that should be allowed. Mind, Mr. Kelly, when we're talking about acceptable songs, uh, do you ex do you believe that the famine song or the role of honour are acceptable songs to sing at a football match? I'm not going to run through a you know a, no, I'm just asked two songs. No, I'm not going to run through a songbook, uh, Mr. Adams. Particularly, particularly as to, can I stop here? We've we've got now an hour and a half, uh, more or less, to 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 cover a lot of um, areas. The member, um, George Adam, you've indicated you have areas of interest, as have other members, um, that you're interested in questioning. In fairness to the person in charge of the bill, Mr Kelly, and to the other members, I'd be grateful if members could um, get on with the line of questioning that they indicated they had an interest in. OK, then. Yeah. Well, I'll just uh, finish with... Uh, you mentioned about academics that came along to the committee. Now, Stuart, Dr. Stuart Waiton says it's a football fan's right to be offensive at football. Do you agree with that? No, I, th I think, as I made clear, um, I support... Uh, I think people should sing football songs at the football ground. I do recognise that people have the right to political expression, but they don't have the right to be you know, hateful towards religious groups, uh, based on sex, Waiting, sex or race. I'm, I'm laying out my position, Mr Adam, mm -hmm. um, that, that I've made clear throughout that I think people should sing football songs. I support the right for legitimate uh, political expression, but I don't support uh, hateful songs or hateful actions, whether it's in a football ground or in the street or a local community or outside a religious venue. Thank you, Convener. Gregor, very briefly, if it's not briefly, we'll have to move on. Phil Thanks, Convener. Hey, and welcome, hey, Mr Kelly. You said that you think that people should sing football songs hey, at football matches. If people who don't go to matches find those songs offensive, what would you say to them? What do you mean, the football songs offensive? Yeah. Well, I would hope if people were singing football songs, they were getting behind their 
uh, their club on the pitch, so I'm not really seeing the point in making. So what I'm saying is if some of the songs that you are declaring are football songs, if other people in the public find them offensive, is that just tough for them? I don't I think, with all due respect, I don't think you understand the position I'm outlining. What I'm saying is, as a football supporter, I go to the football to support uh, my club, and in terms of doing that, I would sing football songs, you know, which are getting behind the team on the park. Uh, I don't see how... I'm not understanding how that, that's offensive. No. I've heard a lot about the message that repeal would send, uh, not only in general, but to football fans. Uh, it has been suggested to this committee that repeal could lead some supporters to believe that certain behaviours have been decriminalised. Uh, how do you respond to that? I think there has been a lot of discussion uh, about the, the message, and I think there's been a lot of simplification uh, and generalisation around that. I actually think the message uh, around this legislation is quite a weak one, because if you look at it, uh, it the, the, led, the current legislation only has the support of one political party in this parliament, only the support of one political party at the time of the 2011 bill passing, and that continues to be the case. The, the legislation has also um, been called into question you know, by legal, ground, legal groups, so, like the Law Society, so it is, uh, it is bad law um, and, you know, there are serious issues about the, the overreach of the law. Um, so what, what we actually have in terms of the legislation is a disjointed approach. Um, we don't have full support from political parties. We don't have full support from legal organisations. We don't have full support from football supporters. Uh, and football clubs. We haven't been called into question by human rights groups. And I think one commentator described this as the worst piece of legislation that had ever been passed by the Scottish Parliament. And I think when you see such a divided opinion on it, then that reinforces that view. So we don't, therefore, have a strong message. In terms of moving forward and dealing with the issue about decriminalising um, you know, certain actions, I think what is needed is a more unified approach. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, hateful songs can be prosecuted uh, against religious groups can be prosecuted uh, under Section 74 of the 2003 uh, Criminal Justice Scotland Act. Uh, and I think that's something everyone would agree on. And I, I think getting, getting all the different groups behind that one message that these hateful songs aren't appropriate there's legislation to deal with it and also tying it in to education and better collaboration between fans, police and clubs. I think that's a much more effective way going forward. Just press you, if I may, on the, the, the actual message. Um, are you aware or has anyone adduced any evidence uh, of any data on what message is actually heard by football fans? If we accept that we can isolate who is actually singing this, to within a reasonable population. Has anyone gathered any data on what they understood when the legislation was brought in? What message was heard by those groups? And what those groups would hear if that legislation were taken away? Are you aware of any data having been uh, collated? Um, what, what I, I don't have data, I'll come, come on to comment directly on it. I don't have data directly in relation to that, but what I would say is that the, the message that those supporting this legislation have sought to put out is that this is about um, stopping, uh, uh, tackling anti-sectarian behaviour, despite the fact that's not stated on the face of the bill and it's not defined in the bill. And I think it's, it, it's failed in that regard because if you look at the latest uh, st statistics on religious hate crime which have been provided to the committee, in terms of 2016-17, there are 719 uh, charges in re relation to religious hate crime. And that's the highest it's been in the last four years. I think that's a serious problem. Only 46 of those uh, relate to the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. So less than 7% uh, of the charges actually relate to football. And to me, that, what that demonstrates is 
we do have a serious problem with religious hate crime in Scotland, um, and it's something that should concern all of us. However, the idea that, it's, that it all carries on around the football has been blown out of the water by the fact that only 7% of the charges um, re relate to hate crime. I think in terms of those who are at the football, I think there's a, a confusing message, as, as some have said in, in evidence. It's confusing as to what actually is uh, criminal activity or what, uh, what will be captured under the Act and what not. So people aren't, you know, the, the reality is, as I've said throughout, you know, my, my kind of opening position is that people should sing um, football songs. However, uh, I recognise that people sing a range of songs, um, but people aren't clear as to what what is criminal and what's not criminal under the Act. And that is, is also reinforced, as the Law Society said it, by the, the confusing definitions in terms of what's offensive behaviour. Thank you, convener. Uh, there was just a point I was looking to clarify because you mentioned in your response to George Adam and you talked just there as well about a football song. Um, and you said that, you, that you've been clear in what you've been trying to say, but George Adam asked specifically about the, the famine song and Roll of Honour. And I, don't, I have to admit, I mean, I don't regularly frequent football matches a lot. When I do, it tends to be at Brecon City. Um, but it is really just to clarify then, can you explain what to you is a football song? Do those songs count as football songs and what would fall into that bracket? Sorry, I think I've been... Can I stop here? Um, I'm getting advice from the clerks that we need to stick within the provision of the bills. We've already covered this ground and I think we're not going to move much further on it. Anything else you want to ask under that general kind There of are some point? things I would like to ask, but I do think that's a, an important point of clarification and to understand what the member means by that. And I, I think it's important to get that yeah. on the official record. I'm but quite happy. I, I, I think I've already been quite clear. I've said very clearly that a football song is a song relating to football and getting, getting behind the football team on the pitch. Um, I've also said very clearly that hateful songs that are abusive towards religious groups uh, or based on, on race or gender are totally unacceptable. But I've also uh, said that I understand and I accept that there, there, are, um, that there should be freedom of expression. Uh, leaving aside hateful demonstrations or songs, there should be freedom of expression. You know, for example, um, at the 1988 Scottish Cup final, I took part in a political dis demonstration against the Conservative Prime Minister, uh, Margaret Thatcher, who was presenting the trophy that day. There was a red card display. That's a legitimate um, act of political expression within a football ground. Some might argue that those kind of acts might be criminalised under this legislation. So uh, I believe in the right of you know, freedom of uh, political expression. I don't believe that that should include hateful songs or demonstrations. Um, but I do uh, support the idea that people should concentrate on getting behind their football team. Thank you. Um, just to follow on from Liam Kerr's uh, questions too and about the overall message that is sent out, we received uh, evidence, as you'll be aware, from a number of different groups. Uh, and with the submission from Church of Scotland, we heard that repealing the Act without replacement would be a symbol that our elected representatives do not think that behaving offensively or sending threatening communications is problematic. At a time of rising levels of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and where sectarianism remains a reality of life in Scotland, the wider implications of repeal should be taken into account. And there were no, by, by no means alone in that with Stonewall, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, amongst others, expressing similar concerns. So how would you respond to the, the concerns that these groups have put forward? Well, I, I don't favour um, keeping in place a piece of legislation, A, that targets football fans, and B, as outlined to Mr Kerr, uh, I think has actually got quite a weak message around it. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, protections to, to, to particular groups, in, in relation to Section 1 to 5, um, as the Law Society and the Human Rights Commission have uh, reiterated, the, the legislation is open uh, to potential legal challenge, so it's weak in that regard. In relation to Section 6, uh, as the police told us, it's too tightly drafted and it's not, it's not really used uh, much at all. 
um, it's used in the Communications Act is, is used in terms of threatening communications. So I don't believe that keeping in place a weak piece of legislation uh, is effective in terms of uh, offering A, a message, or B, any protection. I think the way forward is to reinforce the credible existing laws, uh, do more in terms of education to get across a message of uh, tolerance in society, and for uh, clubs, police and fans to, to work together, as was suggested by the Scottish Football Supporters Association. I believe that to be the way forward. It's fair to pick on some of the evidence that we've heard and some of the people that gave evidence. And uh, by doing that, you're suggesting that the other groups who gave evidence then, it's, it's somehow less legitimate. Um, and I think that, obviously, we've reviewed quite a lot of legislation through this committee and everybody's entitled to express their opinion and all of those views are legitimate uh, in spite you don't just pick and choose the ones that agree with your own point of view um, now in term I just have another question and it was about some of the questions that you put to the to the minister uh, last week because we've heard a lot about the rights of football fans and their views of the legislation and it was suggested through your line of questioning to the minister last week that if you don't attend football regularly you can't really have an opinion on the act um, but the behaviour of uh, fans at football uh, does have a wider impact it has uh, an impact on the people that are either commuting to the matches uh, we heard about some of that and some of the, uh, the some of the incidents that have, for example, happened on trains. And what about the rights of these people? I mean, does that factor in your thinking at all? And is it right that, that it, don't you think that by pushing the repeal of this act that really ignores the, the wider rights of people in the, the community? And for example, like I say, people just commuting on the train, for example. Members, could you please stick to the line of questioning more or less? There is some latitude, but you're being most unfair and selfish to other committee members when you're going off at a tangent, when we've got so much to cover. I can allow a, a, as much latitude as I can, but please bear that in mind. Mr Kelly, please. Um, I mean, I, t I take all the evidence that's been submitted seriously. I don't know where you're coming from in saying that I'm you know, picking against particular bits of evidence. Obviously, I look at the evidence uh, very, very seriously. I mean, for example, you quoted uh, Ms. Goujon last week uh, a statistic that there had been a 50% rise in uh, football-related incidents in public transport, and I wasn't able to source that evidence. But in looking at the stats provided to the committee, I actually see that incidents in public transport in, in relation to public transport have gone down behalf. So it's important to be uh, accurate in relation to the committee. And I think in terms of the, the general point, um, people are offered be better protection and will, pe will, will feel safer if there's effective legislation in place. This is not effective and credible legislation. Um, uh, and until we get to a position where we have legislation on this issue that we can get a more unified uh, approach on and also looks at the wider issue um, around religious hate crime, uh, I think it's only then that we can start to move forward credibly. Carter, supplementary. Just following on Mary Gujon's um, uh, question, she, I think, very um, fairly uh, articulated the concerns that have been raised with us about the, the, the message that may be sent if we repeal um, the, uh, the Act uh, as it stands. Um, However, is there, is there not a risk, and I think we all accept that legislation can send a strong message, but is there not a risk um, that we raise false confidence, um, raise false expectations about the protections that are provided um, if we uh, indulge the view that, in this case, the, the 2012 Act provides the protection um, that, from all the statistics we've seen, it patently, uh, it patently doesn't? Is that not equally a risk? Um, in terms of the, the message we send out. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's important to, to understand it's not just the message, the, 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 it's not just the legislation on its own. You know, as I've said in answer to previous questions, I think there's a, looking at the statistics, I was shocked to see that the religious hate crime stats had, um, you, you know, were higher now than they've been in each of the previous three years. And I think there's a real... The real issue around there, um, you know, some of the 
the well-founded, you know, people who, who were supporting the original legislation on a well-founded basis uh, were doing it on the basis to uh, try and tackle religious in, intolerance. Um, and I think that, it, you know, what it, show, what it shows is you need a much wider discussion. For example, those 17, 719 charges, there's no, in the information provided to the committee, there's no analysis as to what, why that's happening. And I think we need an assessment of that. And we need you know, proper action through Scottish Government justice policy, not just legislation. Thank you, Convener. Um, yeah, can I ask you about um, the feedback you've had from fans who support your repeal? Um, I'm a bit confused as to what it is they actually want to do when they go to a football match. How is the Act impeding their enjoyment of a football match? Well, I think first and foremost, their main objection is that we've got a piece of legislation that targets uh, football fans. One of the witnesses in evidence said that, you know, if you look across Europe and you look to, for example, to areas like Poland and Turkey, where there are serious crowd disorder problems, uh, they don't uh, have legislation in place in these countries. So people uh, fundamentally object to the idea that we have a piece of legislation in place that, uh, that targets specifically football fans. And I think the other thing that I would add to that is that linked to the legislation, the way that it's been um, policed, um, I mean, quite interestingly, uh, this morning we heard from the former Justice Secretary, Kenny McCaskill, saying that the police were run ragged and they don't have time uh, in order to investigate you know, low-level crime. And I think people find it staggering, therefore, that we spend £2 million supporting a police unit that films uh, supporters going into the grounds, uh, recording CCTV, when people have been told that we might not have the resources to deal with antisocial behaviour or acts of vandalism in the street. So, so in summary, football supporters uh, don't like the fact that they specifically have been targeted with legislation, which is pretty unique in Europe, uh, and also that they're, in instances, they're, they're filmed going into the football grounds, and that's deteriorated the relationship with the police. Okay, and in your opening statement, um, <clears throat> you said a, what some people would term sectarian singing. So, I've been to football matches, I've heard sectarian singing, what I would term sectarian singing. Do you deny that sectarian singing does not happen at football matches? No, I don't. I, I never, I never said that. I don't. I think we but all. Some people would term sectarian singing. I, I just want to I know think, what you think sectarian singing is. I think we all due respect. <coughs> I made clear throughout this evidence session that I regard the, the singing of hateful songs against religious religious groups, whether it takes place in the football ground or outside a religious venue or in a club or a pub, is totally unacceptable, and it should be prosecuted and Section 74 of the 2003 Criminal Justice Scotland Act is there in order to do that. So I, I can't be any clearer, but I don't find that behaviour acceptable. OK. Um, can I go on then to ask you, um, if the repeal, the repeal bill is passed, what will happen to the cases that are currently going through the, the system? What do you think should happen? Well, as I've said in the... Um, in the as I've outlined in the, the, the transitional arrangements, um, any cases that are currently going through the system should fall at the date of royal assent. Right. And have you had any contact with that? Do you no, know I've not had any contact with a Lord Advocate. Obviously, okay. the, 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 I've, uh, I've, run a con I've run a consultation on the bill. There's not been any feedback from the Lord okay. Advocate. Well, that. you've said quite a few times that you, you know, that the, the Act isn't needed because it's, it's uh, crimes committed under the Act are covered by other legislation. Yeah. So would it be your intention for those currently going through the court to be tried under that existing legislation? And well, is there any precedent <clears throat> for something like that? Well, that's, that's really a matter for the legal authorities to consider as this bill makes its way uh, through Parliament. My point of view is, as backed up by the Law Society, is that pre-existing legislation could capture uh, all the cases that, uh, that come through in 2016, 17, uh, and certainly any ongoing cases. Okay, what I'm 
you know, what I still struggle with is the fact that you say that, um, you know, crimes of, of hate, uh, songs of hate uh, and discrimination should be legislated against, and, and yet you want to repeal an act which actually specifically does that. I, I, I don't get that. If, if that's what you believe, why would you object to this act? Because I, what I actually, in terms of good law, what I actually believe is that uh, if someone commits a hateful act outside a religious venue, in a club or a pub, in a local community or a football ground, that is unacceptable and can be prosecuted under Section 74 of the Criminal uh, Justice Scotland Act 2003. I actually believe that one piece of legislation is more effective than, uh, than, than two pieces of legislation. Why do, we need, why do we need different pieces of legislation to prosecute unacceptable behaviour uh, in different venues? I don't understand that. But it's why you should care about that that I don't understand. So, so okay. because, because okay. I care about good law and good practice, oh. and I think okay. having, having, having one law covering the offences in all these places is more effective than two laws, particularly when one of the laws uh, in terms of this act is, is so discredited. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay Ben McPherson. Convener, good morning. The no. mentioned the. Um, issues around section one that you've, you've highlighted. Um, have you received any representations from fans regarding the Lord Advocate's guidelines? I think people, uh, I think people in general, uh, you know, feel that in terms of, obviously the, the Lord Advocate's guidelines are guidelines, they're not the legislation. Um, and therefore the legislation is, is what the courts uh, will give, you know, primary uh, priority to and what uh, fans are concerned about is the interpretation in terms of the legislation and the power that that gives to individual police officers. I mean essentially as we heard in one of the previous evidence sessions, police officers uh, have had to be trained in terms of what may or may not be offensive behaviour and we have a situation under the Act where if people begin to sing a song, what the police officer requires to do is get himself in the mindset of, you know, uh, is this offensive? Would a reasonable person be offended? Is this likely to incite uh, public uh, disorder? And he's got to kind of think of his training, training manual. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's effective law. And it's the, 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 the concerns that the supporters have is that, you know, there's, there's just a lack of clarity over what is criminal and not criminal activity in this act. Thank you. I've got the, the Lord Advocate's guidelines in front of me, but I won't read them out for, for time, uh, issues of time. But in your policy memorandum, you suggest that the bill will reduce the fear for some attending football matches. But the Lord Advocate's guidelines are very clear about what behaviour is criminalised under the act. Hateful behaviour, threatening behaviour, and other offensive behaviours in, in relation to race, colour, nationality, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, transgender identity or disability. In removing those protections, what um, I'm interested in is how can your bill reduce fear for some people attending football matches other than reducing the fears of people being caught who want to indulge in, in such behaviour? It, it reduces the, the fear because... Uh, it's taken away a piece of legislation which is not working effectively and is targeting football fans. So I don't think, I don't think when the, the, the law is as contested as this one is, then it's effective in giving people proper protection. I think reinforcing the more credible existing legislation uh, would be a more uh, credible way going forward. I think there continues to be uh, confusion as to you know, what, what is legitimate and not, not legitimate under the Act. We heard from the, the Bemis representative, and as I've reiterated throughout this, um, in terms of hateful behaviour, that's unacceptable and should be captured under the Act. However, there are instances where people are uh, participating in acts of political expression, they're celebrating uh, their, their culture, they're celebrating particular dates, um, and there's a lot of confusion as to 
whether these are criminal, criminal acts or not under the legislation. I think that, that's an interesting and an, an important point, and I'm, I'm interested in what behaviours you believe that the Act prevents fans from displaying. I, I know this has been asked in several times already, but it's, it, it's still very vague and ambiguous what you're, what you're saying that can't be, can't be undertaken and can't be displayed. Well, I, I think I'm in very clear in that uh, I think any hateful action towards groups or individuals is unacceptable and can be captured under pre-existing legislation. But under this law? That's, well, that's the question that, that we're all interested in. Mr Kelly, sure. uh, is it a, a case of context sometimes? Uh, it depends on context. Something could be hateful in some situation, not in another. I think that's a point that um, the, the, the Law Society and a number of the legal representatives uh, have made. However, I think the, the confusion... I mean, if you take the example that I gave to the Minister last week, where there was a, an act of political demonstration in support of... Um, under this Act, in terms of what happened last week? It, sorry, in terms of the, 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 terms of, yeah. the Palestinian display, uh, as I said to the Minister... Um, I don't think there was. No, that's the, that, and that's the point I was going on to make. That, uh, as was said at the time, the police yeah. concluded that there was no action to be taken under this legislation. And people look at that, and they look at I, then, then displays of support for Irish nationalism, Scottish nationalism. I gave the example of somebody with a Catalan flag being removed from Ibrox. So there's, there's confusion as to what is a legitimate expression of political support and what might be criminal under the Act. A lot of technical yeah, questions I'll, I'll, to get to on the provisions of the, the bill. The next points that you've asked me to, to probe. Now right would be now helpful, Mr McPherson. Um, so I think that, that point about confusion is, a, is an interesting one. And um, as you know, the Scottish Government remains open to changes to the legislation and based on evidence, and that the ministers uh, made that point, but also stated that no suggestions for amendment have been forthcoming. I'm just really interested in why... So you have stated today that you disagree with hateful behaviour at football matches. That's the same view of the Minister and the Government. Why was there not a constructive process undertaken to try and amend the 2012 Act? Why go for the very fundamental view of abolition? Surely we can work together as legislators in this Parliament with the Government to try and improve existing legislation and be responsible in that way. I suppose the fundamental difference between me and you, Mr. McPherson, and myself and the government is that, you know, I disagree with the principle that you should have legislation targeting football fans. Uh, I, I've never been convinced of that case, and uh, that's, that's where my fundamental disagreement is. Uh, in addition to that, as I've outlined, I don't yeah. think the legislation uh, works well in practice. So that you're against the offensive behaviour, you're against the threatening communications, but it's the football part that you've got a real issue with. No, uh, so no. why not bring forward constructive amendments to try and engage in a wider process around that? No, because, I, as I've said, I fundamentally disagree that football fans should be targeted by legislation. In terms of behaviour, uh, I accept that, uh, as I've said, if there's hateful behaviour in the street or in the football ground, uh, that should be tackled. However... Uh, I think that can be tackled more effectively using pre-existing legislation and with a, a, a more unified message than the message that comes out um, from the controversies around this legislation. I mean, I think the, the gaps in your argument are quite significant with respect, Mr Kelly, because I think that... The, the, we really I, the, must move on. Mr Kelly's made it clear he, um, he doesn't agree with specific legislation tackling... I'm about, I'm about to come on to the last point, okay. if that's okay. Thank you. Um, so, one of the significant criticisms we've heard from witnesses, so not, not my words, uh, is that there's no alternative being proposed with regard to tackling behaviour at football matches. If 
you're successful and, and the current legislation is repealed. Is that a fair criticism to, to say there's no alternative? I don't think it's a fair criticism. As I've consistently outlined this morning, uh, I don't think this is about the, the repeal of this legislation and then the matter finishes. I've said that what is then needed is we need a more unified approach. I'm quite prepared to work with other political parties. Um, I think we need to bring the football clubs and the, the fans and the police together. So there, there are three strands that are needed to it. Um, I think we need to reinforce the more credible pre-existing legislation and we need a more unified message, not just coming out of this parliament, but from others that are interested in tackling uh, religious, r religious hate crime. I think we also need uh, more focus on, uh, you know, a, a message of tolerance uh, in our education system. So I would take the, the cameras off the police fans and use the money to invest in anti-sectarian education uh, in education. And thirdly, as the Scottish Football Supporters Association outlined, um, I think we need a more collaborative approach between the supporters, the police and the clubs. Um, I think that relationship has deteriorated in recent years and we need to bring it together. So I think those three strands are the alternative. To either support the legislation in full or support parts of the, the current legislation, P Police Scotland, Fiscal Service, Stonewall Scotland, Equality Network, Women's, the Scottish Women's Council, Victim Support Scotland, the Church of Scotland, the Scottish Council of Jewish Communities, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, who all think we should be looking at an alternative and collaborating, perhaps waiting until after the, the Bracken deal review, <coughs> rather than this very fundamental approach of abolishing the current act. They're all wrong and, is that, is that the assessment? A question on the Bracken deal review and we'll move on to that later. Um, I, I think that the members are aware of the evidence that's that against you, it and it's not moving us forward. Mary Gouchon, please. <coughs> Sorry, no, I didn't know. Oh, sorry, Morris. Morris. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Kavina. Uh, Mr. Kelly, how, how, how would your proposed um, repeal of Section 1 of the 2012 Act provide legal certainty uh, for football fans as to what is and what is not an offence within the context of a football match? And indeed, how can greater, greater clarity for fans be achieved? Um, uh, I would point you to the, the Law Society submission, uh, which states quite clearly that all 377 charges in 2016 could have been captured by pre-existing legislation. Uh, as I said in answer to Mr McPherson uh, and others, uh, I don't actually believe it's good law or effective law um, to have one set of legislation for uh, an appropriate behaviour in a football ground and one out in the street. So I believe that the, the existing laws are more credible and will provide legal certainty. As the Scottish Human Rights Commission pointed out, there are potential ECHR uh, breaches if this uh, legislation was, were to continue. And legal certainty was one of the issues that they highlighted that was potentially open to challenge. So I actually believe that by taking this legislation off the stocks and using the more credible pre-existing legislation, then we will be able to establish greater legal certainty. Thank you. Uh, Mary. Thank you, Good afternoon, Mr. Mr. Kelly. Um, the, the government have um, referred to the distinctiveness of, of the football culture and the problems that arise as a result of that culture. Um, has this characterisation had any impact on the way the bill has been perceived by fans? And has isolating fans in, in this way added to the belief that they are being unfairly targeted? Um, I mean, I think in, in terms of football culture, you know, I would make the point, I reiterate the point that I made at the start that there's been a dramatic behaviour, a dramatic improvement in crowd behaviour in the atmosphere around football um, in the, the 40 years that I've been attending games. Um, and we don't see the same element of, you know, public disorder, drunken behaviour fights in and outside stadiums that we saw, you know, perhaps um, th 30 years ago. I think that the, the fundament, that being, that being the case, and, and I'm not trying in any way to, you know, kind of sugarcoat it and say there isn't any 
uh, there isn't any kind of bad behaviour or public disorder. Um, however, I think it's got to be seen in context. And I think in that context, football supporters can't really understand um, why they have been targeted for legislation. You know, for example, uh, over the period that Tea in the Park was in place, there were 3,600 incidents, including some serious incidents of sexual assault, attempted murder, but there's not any specific legislation you know, targeted at concert course. So when, when football fans see that, they, they question the, the, the validity of what, what has been put across here. I mean, the government are also of the view that offensive and threatening behaviour displayed by football <coughs> fans um, is, is only at football that you get that behaviour or there is no other sport that, that attracts that, that element of, of sectarian and, and abusive behaviour. Is that a, a, a position you agree with? I think what I would say is that offensive or um, threatening behaviour, whether it takes place um, outside in the street, you know, in a pub or a club or at a football ground, is totally unacceptable. Um, and, you know, we need effective legislation to ta and consistent legislation to target it. I'd, I fail to understand why we need a particular set of legislation that focuses in and around the, the football stadium. I don't think that's effective, and I don't think it's fair to tackle football fans. Okay. The evidence that we've had from Bemis um, has suggested that the 2012 Act has had a neg negligible effect when it comes to tackling hate crime. And I note the, the comments in your um, earlier response about the, um, the, the figures relating to religious hate crime. Um, do you think the Act has been successful at all in tackling that type of behaviour? And if it's not, what do you think should be put in place? Um, I mean, I, th I think... Um you know, I think the Act's not been successful, you know, as I, as I said earlier. I mean, 719 religious hate crime incidents, um, less than 7% of, of which took place uh, in and around the, the football stadium. Um, and the, the, the scale of that shows that there's still a big issue about religious intolerance. I think to, to look at it another way, if the, the purpose of the Act was to, you know, reduce, if you like, you know, non-football songs. Um, I think the reality is, as we've heard from a number of witnesses, that the, you know, that the, the, it's not been effective in that regard. You know, and in some instances, um, you know, f fans are singing more and more non-football songs. You know, so it's, it's not actually achieved its objective. Who do you think should be responsible for tackling that behaviour then? Well, I think, as I, uh, as I said in the previous answer, I think we need more emphasis on um, promoting you know, tolerance and respect within the, the education system. And I think if we actually had a proper collaborative approach between fans, the police uh, and the clubs, um, that can get a message across to, 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 to fans uh, much more directly where inappropriate songs uh, are being sung, you know, because I think in discussions between fans and clubs, cl clubs, you know, can can be very, very frank, you know, where it's maybe not possible in the same way for police representatives. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, some um, people have suggested, Mr Kelly, that we're waiting for the Bracadale review on hate crime might make sense before repealing the Act. Um, they've suggested the review might increase the likelihood of some clarity around the Act. Um, so could you address that point and why you think it's necessary to repeal the Act now? I think um, the Bracadale review has got a very important job to do in terms of the hate crime legislation uh, to make that more streamlined and efficient uh, and, may, and offer pe people uh, some of the protections that some of the committee members uh, have spoken about. So I regard that as uh, a very important piece of work. However, I think Liam MacArthur you know, made an, an excellent point when this was being discussed last week. And he said that the committee are currently looking at civil litigation legislation. And that was kind of driven by the Taylor report, which was produced in 2013. So there's a big gap between um, the production of that report and the actual legislation. Uh, and I'd, I simply don't think it's acceptable to leave 
what I believe to be uh, a fundamentally unfair piece of legislation that's not working properly in place until we await the, the outcome and the, the work that's going to be driven by the Brackendale Review. Right, thank you. Fulton McGregor. <clears throat> Mr Kelly, you say that the legislation uh, targets football fans, and you've consistently said that. Others might say that it uniquely protects football fans and others from what's a serious issue in a Scottish context and actually recognises the important role the game has in our country. And I just offer that for comment. Um, the question I want to ask you just now, Mr Kelly, is way back at the beginning uh, of our evidence sessions, we heard quite a powerful statement from the, the Crown Office the repeal would leave a gap in the law. Have you time to reflect on that? Can you can you elaborate on what you what you mean by a gap in the law? Well, the the Crown Office and Prosecutor Service said that there was powers in the in the current Act that allowed them to prosecute certain offences that they wouldn't otherwise be able to, um, and they gave quite a, a quite a strong statement that repeal of the Act would uh, lead to a gap in the law. And I want to know what your view on that is. I've made my position consistent throughout. Uh, I don't believe the, the, there's a gap in the law. Um, I, uh, in, in terms of the section one to five event, uh, offence, um, the Law Society have made clear that uh, all, all offences in relation to that could be captured under uh, pre-existing legislation going from Section 38 through uh, Criminal Justice and Licensing Act through to Section 74, the uh, Criminal Justice uh, Scotland Act to 2003. In terms of uh, Section 6, as we've heard from the police, the, the threshold... Um, I mean, I think in terms of Section 6, I, I think there was a reasonable objective in bringing that forward. However, the... The, the act in practice has meant that because, the, because of the way it's been drafted and the threshold's too high, as the police have told us, that the reality is that cases have been prosecuted through Section 127, the Communications Act, uh, as opposed to uh, Section 6, Threatening Communications. OK. I want to move quickly on to policing as well. Um, your policy memorandum suggests that the relationship between fans and police has deteriorated. You've mentioned that already because of the Act. And, but you're aware that the Act makes no provision uh, for policing. And Police Scotland has already told the committee that policing won't change if the Act is repealed. And we heard that in evidence. So how exactly do you think that repealing the Act will improve the relationship between police and fans? Well, as I've said a number of times throughout the session, um, I think there needs to be some serious work done to you know, rebuild the relationship between fans, police and clubs. And I, I believe that people, as was suggested by the Scottish Football Supporters Association, um, you know, forums should be set up so that these, these bodies can seriously uh, work together. I also think that you know, there needs to be a serious look at how the, how the matches are policed. As I said earlier, if you have a former Justice Secretary telling you that low-level crime um, you know, the police officers are run ragged and wouldn't be able to investigate low-level crime. Uh, and that's a, that's a serious issue in itself. But the public will then wonder why uh, resources are being wasted on filming uh, football supporters inside and outside the stadiums. But, you know, I, I think the key point is that there needs to be a, some serious work by everybody, you know, the supporters, the clubs and the police to rebuild that relationship. You've mentioned the, the rebuilding of the relationship between fans and police uh, a number of times. Are you referring to all fans in the police or certain groups of fans in police? And if it's the latter, would you be able to expand on, on what groups? Well, obviously, um, supporters are, are, are represent, have groups in there. They, they have representatives who you know, are liaise with clubs and the police. But I think it's important that, you know, all fans are involved in this, in the sense that they've got an avenue of communication, either into their representatives or, you know, directly to the police. I think, you know, I think for it to work, everybody needs to be involved and everybody needs to be committed to it. But do you think currently that all fans 
have relationship difficulties with the police, all fans that go to football games? No, no, I'm not, I'm not saying that all fans have relationship difficulties. We, obviously, as, as we've heard um, in some of the evidence sessions, there, there, are, there are always ongoing discussions with the police, so I'm not trying to say that you know, there's no communication whatsoever, but it's quite clear that um, as a result of the Act and the way matches have been policed, then uh, there's more friction between police and fans than there was previously. Uh, and I think if we're to move forward the, the atmosphere, we need to rebuild those relationships. OK, thanks for that. Um, you've given... You've when we move on, Fulton, a very brief... A very brief supplementary on the gap in the law. I don't know if you wanted to finish your point. Okay, yeah, I'm still, I'm still on police yep. just now. It's, um, yep. So I was going to talk about... You, you talked about some of the... The, the, the ways the uh, police have managed games, I think you've referred to it as disproportionate policing. Um, are you able to give any examples of this, uh, why you think it was dispro disproportionate and why you don't, therefore, believe, if you believe it's disproportionate, that it wasn't the police officers uh, responding appropriately in the best way they could to those specific circumstances? Well, to, I mean, to, to give um, two examples, um, you know, I've actually seen instances myself where the police will spend a good bit of the game filming supporters. You know, I don't understand what that's for. Uh, and others, I've also seen uh, photographs of uh, a police officer at a football game in Perth where he actually had photographs in front of him of <coughs> what could probably only be described as fans that you know they, they might regard as needing more attention from the police. You know, that sort of policing is um, at odds with what we usually see in Scotland. So if the policing is such an issue for you and, and it's such a fundamental part of this repeal act, why did you call for repealing of the act rather than a review of policing in football? Repealing the act will not change the policing at football. As I've already said. Well, what, I, what, what I've said consistently is uh, I, want, I seek repeal of the Act because I think it's unfair that football fans are targeted and I don't think the, the legislation is working. I think separate to, add to that, you know, there needs to be work done with supporters and the police and the clubs to rebuild a better relationship in order that we get more effective policing. And, and in addition to that, if we've got a former Justice Secretary telling us that low-level crime can't be getting investigated because police officers are getting run ragged, then we need to have a serious look at the amount of resources that we're putting into police and football games. But do you not agree with me that if you had taken to the Justice Secretary um, some of your concerns over the policing issues specifically, taking that to him, you could have worked with him and the Scottish Government to come up with a, a better solution, but perhaps that wouldn't have been as politically a emotive for you as going for a repeal of the Act. Yeah, but it would, it, it, if, if you still... Yes, that's been covered already. Okay, well, thanks, been if we could move on with the rest of the policing questions, Maurice. Sorry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Kelly, would you concede that police officers must, must carry out their duties regardless of how unpopular a piece of legislation uh, is? Yeah, I accept that. The, 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 the police need to take forward... Um, the law of the land is passed by Parliament, so they, in, in terms of this legislation, although I oppose it and believe it's deeply flawed, uh, it, it is the law that's in place currently. I think it puts them in a difficult position, uh, as I said in relation to in one of the earlier answers, in terms of uh, you know, trying to interpret what is offensive behaviour. I think mm -hmm. there's such a wide definition within the bill, and police officers have had to be trained uh, in terms of what might be offensive, I think that, that's put police in a, a difficult mm. position. Can I follow on? Uh, yeah, uh, Mr Kenny, do you believe that the repeal of the 2012 Act will automatically repair uh, the perceived loss of trust uh, between the police and the fans? No, I think, as, uh, as I said uh, in answer to uh, Fulton McGregor, you know, I don't see, I don't see the, the repeal of this Act being at the end of the matter. I think there's a job for all of us to do in terms of putting out a message that, you know, religious intolerance uh, is, is unacceptable, pointing to effective legislation to deal with that. And there's a big job to be done 
uh, in terms of the police and also the, the supporters, it's a two-way street, to work together in order to, to build that trust. So that there needs to be, you know, there's a programme, in my opinion, a programme of work would be required going forward following the repeal of this Act. And a little follow on, Chair, if I may. And Mr Kelly, would you agree that the behavioural problems uh, for policing occur only where certain teams are playing each other? Um, well, I mean, obviously, um, I mean, obviously, in terms of police resources, what they will understandably do is they will target the games where there are, there are bigger attendances and they will target the games where there's been trouble on previous occasions. I understand that in terms of the way you would, the, the way you would allocate resources um, and the, 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 the games that would be prioritised. Right, thank you. Okay, Liam McArthur. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. The, the, I would say from the evidence that we've heard, um, most of the criticism that's been levelled against the Act has been in relation to, to Section 1 um, of, of the Act. Um, I think we've already covered the issue as to whether or not you believe there would be a, a gap in the existing law where um, repeal to, uh, to take uh, place in relation to Section 1. In relation to Section 6, it seemed to be more of a nuanced uh, argument that we were getting from, from those we've taken evidence from. Uh, what, what's your view as to whether or not there would be a, a, a gap in the law where repeal to take place in relation to the, the offences covered by, by Section 6? I think in terms of Section 6, as I've said, you know, uh, although I'd, uh, back in 2011 I had fundamental disagreements with Sections 1 to 5, um, I, you could see the point in bringing forward Section 6 in terms of threatening communications. And obviously in that five-year period there's been an increase in online usage and sadly in, in, in online abuse. So. You, you can see the case for that. The reality is that um, it's not been widely used at all, Section 6. There's only been 17 cases um, brought forward in the five-year period. And as we heard from the police, uh, that uh, the, the, the threshold is, is too high and therefore prosecutors and police are tending to use Section 127 of the Communications Act. Um, I do accept this in terms of the, the evidence that we've heard in relation, in relation to cases brought forward for indictment. The potential penalties under this Act um, are greater than the Communications Act. Um, the Glasgow Bar Association indicated that one way forward for that might be to strengthen the powers uh, of the Communications Act in relation to Section 127. So I do recognise that as that, that an issue. Uh, I'm prepared to enter discussions with interested parties on that um, and it's something that I'll actively consider prior to the stage one vote. I mean, that's very helpful because I think also in relation to the, <coughs> the, the point that was being made earlier about the message that's sent out by repeal, I think from what you're seeing there um, about the motivations that gave rise to the, 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 the act in the first place, there is perhaps more legitimate concerns about the, the message that's sent out were Section 6 to be repealed in absence of anything else, then would be the case with Section 1. Is that, is that fair? I, I, don't, I don't regard Section 6, in a sense, as, as fit for purpose, you know, because it's not... It's not a, if, if police and prosecutors aren't using it, then it's, it's not effective. I do accept that threatening communications and online abuse is a major issue, and, and considering the repeal of this act, I need to make. I need to be confident, as a person that's putting it forward, that there are appropriate measures and, and protections in place. It's helpful. Thanks very much. Karen. Thank you. Uh, is your supplementary answered, maybe? No. No. Okay. Um, thank you. It's, it's a very brief supplementary on on the gap in the law and the question that Fulton McGregor um, originally raised with you, because this um, legislation is used if someone is on the way to at or watching a football match and they sing an offensive song or use offensive um, or abusive language. If an individual was, was to stand in the middle of a busy shopping centre or stand in the street in a random afternoon and sing that song or use abusive or offensive language, 
which caused offence, would the police be able to prosecute that? Yeah, I mean, if somebody um, stood in a shopping centre in the middle of an after, on this Tuesday afternoon, for example, when there's, there's not any football uh, taking place and they, you know, they, they were hateful and abusive in terms of, you know, towards somebody's religion, um, they would be prosecuted under Section 74 of the 2003 Criminal Justice uh, Act Scotland. And would they be able to be prosecuted if they use sectarian language? Yes, under that, under that same provision. Thank you. That concludes our line of questioning. Can I thank Jane? Kavira, can I just ask, uh, actually make a correction to something Mr Kelly said earlier? <clears throat> By all means, Ms Mr Kelly will have it, the right of reply. Yeah, that's fine. Um, it's just with regard to the comments about um, the Act being incompatible with ECHR. Um, the Appeal Court considered a challenge under the ECHR and it was rejected. Um, and so the, the government, the presiding officer, um, and the Parliament passed this Act as being compatible with ECHR. So I just wanted to correct that. I think you, I believe you said it was incompatible. No, no, um, that's, that's not what I said. And if I'd, yes, you know, please, please clarify. Oh, yes, Mr. Just, Kelly. Sorry? What's, your, what's your response to that? Yeah, um, what, I, what I said, if you listened carefully, and I apologise if, uh, if, if in any way I misled you, but what I said was, if you look at the Scottish Human Rights Commission submission to this committee, which is, uh, is based on hearing the evidence that the committee has taken in relation to this repeal act. They had concerns that there was a potential breach of ECHR, um, particularly in relation to legal certainty. And that was, a, that was a serious issue and that could potentially be uh, a future challenge in relation to... Which their concerns have not been upheld because no, it, was, no. it, wasn't, it wasn't accepted. No, I don't think... You, I, think what you're, I think what you're trying to point out is that when the legislation was originally put before Parliament, it requires a, a compatibility certificate from the presiding officer, and it got that compatibility certificate. I understand that. However, there's nothing to stop once a, a law is... Uh, w w once legislation is in place and has been enacted, somebody can bring forward a challenge saying that ECHR has, has been compromised or undermined, and that's the point that the Scottish Human Rights Commission were making. That it was rejected in the, in the appeal court. Yeah, well that, that was one case, but that doesn't, that doesn't stop other people bringing forward no, challenges, no, no. as both the Human Rights Commission have pointed out and also the Law Society. And I think that's the point I'm making, that there continues to be uncertainty on this legislation. It could be open to further challenges, except what you're saying about previous challenges. That doesn't stop somebody making a further challenge. Okay. That clarification was helpful, and there are no other questions, definitely this time. So that concludes our questioning. Can I thank James Kelly and the officials for attending? Um, agenda item eight is feedback from the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on its meeting of the 7th of December 2016. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions. I refer to members. I refer members to paper six, which will note by the clerk. Um, I will be giving that verbal report as um, the convener of the subcommittee, Mary Fee, was unable to attend. And the report is as follows. The Justice Committee on Policing met on the 7th of December 2017 when it held an evidence session on Police Scotland's custody provision. The subcommittee took evidence from Police Scotland, the Scottish Police Federation, Unison Scotland and Positive Prisons, Positive Future. The subcommittee heard about the role and work of the custody division which was established when Police Scotland was formed. During a previous evidence session on the Police Services financial planning for 2018-19, the subcommittee heard that due to a reduction in the geographical locations in which prisoners can be held, prisoners were routinely conveyed over longer distances than would seem acceptable. The subcommittee scheduled this evidence session to consider custody provision in more detail, specifically the impact on the welfare and care of prisoners in custody and during transportation. The subcommittee will next meet on the 18th of January 2018 when it intends to hold an evidence session on HMI Inspector of Constabulary's report on undercover policing. Do members have any comments or questions? 
There being no comments or questions, we now move into private session. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday 19th of December when we'll consider petitions and undertake scrutiny of the Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19. And we'll suspend briefly to allow the public gallery to clear. <laughs>